Okay, Chair, when you're ready, we are now live on YouTube. Thank you. Thanks very much, Debbie. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to East Devon District Council's Virtual Strategic Planning Committee meeting on the 9th of November, 2021. I'm your Chair, Councillor Dan Ledger. Now, based on the decisions of an extraordinary meeting of the Council on the 26th of July, I would like to remind both members and the public attending or watching that this council has delegated much of its decision, uh, much of its decision taking powers to our senior officers. This is for a short period of time only till the 17th of January 2022 and is due to concerns relating to COVID risk. Consequently, this meeting is being held remotely and on a consultative basis only. We will continue to adhere uh, as closely as possible to the procedural rules detailed in our constitution. However, uh, where a decision, uh, sorry, where a matter would have normally been decided, it will now make a recommendation to a senior officer. The officer will take what the recommendation into account when making their decision. The meeting can be viewed live online and will be recorded. Therefore, may I remind colleagues to be careful with your language and that the code of conduct applies throughout our meeting. We reserve the right to remove and disconnect any participant disrupting the meeting by whatever means, as this meeting is dependent on an internet connection and a power supply. And a, and a power supply. If there is a break in the connection, please bear with us as we try to reconnect. If we're not able to reconnect after 15 minutes, this meeting will be adjourned and reconvened at a later date. Could colleagues please ensure your microphone is muted when you're not speaking? Could you also keep your points short and please don't interrupt? Uh, should anyone wish to comment, please raise your electronic hands and wait to be called. Any members of the public can view the agenda by visiting our website at eastdevon.gov.uk. We'll now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. Can you please now unmute your microphone and when you hear your name, please confirm by saying present. When you've confirmed you're present, please mute your microphone again. So over to you, Debbie. Thank you, Chair. We'll start with you, Councillor Ledger, please. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Yes, I'm here, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arnott. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bonetta. I don't see Councillor Bonetta. Councillor Bailey, please. Present. Thank you. Councillor Blakey. Present, Debbie. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have apologies from Councillor Chamberlain. Councillor Hayward. I don't see Present. Anything. Thank you. Oh, missed you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hayward. Councillor Howe, please. Councillor Howe, are you present? He is here. He just keeps muting himself. I, I am present. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Slingham, please. Present, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. Present. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. Present, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rylance. Present, thank you. thank you. Thank you. And we've had apologies from Councillor Skinner. So I can confirm your core at chair. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Debbie. So agenda item one is public speaking and uh, we don't have any members of the public wishing to speak, but we do have a statement that uh, you're going to read out for us. I think that's great, Debbie. Thank you, Chair. Yep, so this is in relation to agenda item nine on site promotion presentations. And this is a statement from Paul Smith of Cranbrook. It reads as follows. I note with interest that in December 2021, the Strategic Planning Committee is to, is to con consider a draft of the Council's Emerging Local Plan in relation to future planning strategy. This will present members with the opportunity for a complete review of existing strategy and development criteria. Clearly, with 359 HELAR site submissions, committee must rely heavily upon the office's initial assessment as to suitability stroke viability. During your deliberations upon site promotion presentations, I would remind you of EDDC's 2021 public consultation process regarding the future vision for the district, which identified equally held opinions between those who favoured continuance of concentrated large scale urban extensions of existing towns and those who saw the merits of controlled development of smaller villages and communities. 
there appears to have been an acceptance that the large volume house developer will always receive the lion's share of committee's time and consideration. The outcomes the electorate are experiencing is an increasing loss of greenfield land involving urban sprawl and creeping pubescence which threatens the identity of surrounding communities. The NPPF does not preclude development within, in, within an area of outstanding natural beauty and such applications should not automatically be dismissed in a develop, uh, sorry, this makes sense, should not automatically be dismissed if the development is to meet local housing need. Additionally, government guidance and directive is to give greater consideration to small and medium sized developments, as well as for self and customized builders. Development of brownfield sites are preferable to the loss of greenfield. I would ask that you consider these issues within your deliberations today. And as a reminder, that's a statement from Paul Smith from Cranbrook. Back to you, Chair, thank you. Thanks very much for that, Debbie, and thank you very much for that contribution, Mr. Smith. Um, we move on to agenda item two, which are minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, does anyone have any comments? If you could sure. raise your... Yes? Two things. Uh, right? Firstly, do, are we doing apologies? And secondly, um, I, I wanted to say that um, I went, last meeting, when I challenged the, the uh, resident numbers for Broadclist, I did a bit of research and discovered that there are actually 2,573 households in Broadclist paying council tax at the moment. So I think it's fairly safe to assume that there are probably at least that many residents, not the 1,500 we had in our papers for the last, last month. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, uh, to pursue what I was saying last week, last month, I really think we need to make sure that we're using correct figures in, in all our dealings because um, it will guide our, 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 um, our movements better. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Ryan. So I'll, I'll make sure that uh, any figures are corrected and we'll I'll liaise with Mr. Freeman about that. Councillor Miller, you have a question on the minutes? Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's um, with reference to, I think it's paragraph 40, and it's in relation to the discussion we had on fast food outlets. Now, it's referred here in the bullet point that the discussion from the committee members was basically that the market will decide it should not be for the council to limit clusters through planning policy. Now, Councillor Armstrong and myself did express support for us to, um, to consider it further and uh, not, not least because our um, ward includes one of the biggest schools in Europe which is near to the town centre so it's something I want us to look at further. I just wanted to clarify does that given that the report was for noting will you, yourself as chair and the um, service lead take from that um, that we will never consider that matter again because personally I think it really does need to be considered because my view is, is that we only debated an initial uh, sort of couple of sentences there are many councils that that, that have um, really effective policies limiting clusters of fast food outlets which which do work actually so my point is can this come back to, to another meeting and I just wanted to check that the accuracy was that um, I think it was a leader and Councillor Davey, who I respect enormously and I agree with the vast majority of the time. Are they, is that what, is that accurate? Because I did listen to the previous meeting and I, I didn't think the jury, I didn't think that they completely decided. I think it was their initial view on it, which, um, which is fine, but I didn't think that was their final view on the matter. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Miller. I, if I'm honest, I don't really recall the, the moment with off the top of my head. Um, Ed, can I come to you on this? It's, it's something that I, I'm sure that we could debate further at a later meeting and obviously with the, the draft plan only coming, a very rough draft plan coming next month, the, there's a lot that we can still debate across the local plan. Uh, yes, that's right, Chairman. Uh, my understanding was that the, the report basically sought to prompt a, a debate about that and a number of other issues. I don't think any firm conclusions were, were reached, just two different views expressed and recorded in the minutes. Um, we will obviously be picking up those issues when we look at the draft working plan at the December meeting, uh, where we'll be putting forward policies, uh, well, indications of policies to address health considerations. And so there'll be an opportunity there to prompt further discussion of that issue. Still come back. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. So, 
just with regards to the minutes, are there any further questions or are, are we happy just to leave those as approved? Take the indication of no further hands that they are now approved. So thank you, everyone. Uh, agenda item three or apologies. Uh, Debbie, who have we received apologies from? So we've got apologies from Councillor Chamberlain and Councillor Skinner. If anyone else is aware of any, please let me know. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see anyone else, so we'll just take those as noted. Uh, agenda item four are declarations of interest, and we'll do that via a roll call again. So over to you, Debbie. Thank you, Chair. Let's start with you, please. None that I'm aware of, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davey. Sorry, taking a while to unmute. Um, yeah, uh, I'm an Exmouth Town Councillor, <coughs> which is uh, probably going to have some effect on um, site promoter presentations or something like that. Um, I'm not sure it's directly relevant, and obviously that's a personal interest. Thank you. Councillor Allen? Uh, none that I can think of at the moment, but I'll uh, mention... Uh, if they arise. Okay, thank you. Councillor Arnott, please. None, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Thank you. Uh, personal interest is Devon County Councillor. Thank you. Is that any particular item that it's relating to? No, that's general. No, that's for all items. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Blakey, please. None, thanks, Abby. Thank you. Councillor Hayward? None, thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Councillor Howe? Yeah, Member of Bishop's Cliffs Parish Council for all um, the four items on the agenda today, including Exeter Local Plan, where my ward is the adjoining ward to Exeter. Thank you very much. Councillor Ingham, any declarations, none, please? None, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Moulding, please? None. Thank you. Councillor Pratt? None, thank you, Debbie. Thank you. And Councillor Rylance, please. Um, I'm a resident and a, par a parish councillor and district councillor for Broadcliffe Parish. And this is in relation specifically to item seven because it neighbours um, the extra city local plan area. Um, I don't know, maybe much, like Councillor Howe, maybe I should have interest in others, but I can't think of what this specifically might be. But it's a personal interest. Lovely. Thank you very much. OK, Chair, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item five is matters of urgency, so I can confirm that there are no matters of urgency to discuss today. Um, moving on to agenda item six, confidential and exempt items. Again, I can confirm that there are no confidential or exempt items. Um, agenda item seven is the extra local plans issues, and it's over to Mr Ed Freeman to present his first report of the day. So over to you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, members. Um, so this, this first report is uh, drawing members' attention to a consultation that Exeter City Council are currently doing on uh, their new local plan. Uh, this is a first stage consultation, so it's really um, alerting us to the fact that they are starting work on producing uh, a new local plan, which will shape the future of Exeter for the next 20 years. Uh, the consultation, uh, and there's a hyperlink to it in, in, the, in the paper, uh, closes on the 15th of November and, and covers issues like the need for the new local plan, uh, the, the structure of the document as they see it in terms of its contents, the key issues facing the city, uh, which is summarised at paragraph 2.1 in the report. Um, it, it starts to set out a vision for growth uh, around an active and accessible city, um, tackling issues of congestion, accessibility and promoting active and healthy lifestyles, uh, addressing the climate change emergency uh, and um, also talks about uh, some of the patterns and, and quality of future development that they're looking to see in the city, focusing around redevelopment of brownfield land, high density development in the city centre and close by with smaller developments on the edge of the city. 
The, the consultation poses essentially six key questions and the report uh, proposes indicative answers that we would look to submit uh, to those questions. Um, from our point of view as a council, I think the majority of them are quite straightforward. Perhaps the, the key one uh, is question four, uh, which asks for comments and ideas about shaping the future pattern of the city um, in, in which uh, we, we've responded um, by welcoming their focus on redevelopment of brownfield sites, making efficient use of sites within the city centre and limiting growth on the edge of the city, um, which I'm sure will be uh, a, a relief to, to those members whose wards uh, adjoin the city boundary. Uh, we do, however, think it's important to make a point at this stage about where that involves redeveloping existing sites that they seek to accommodate those existing uses within the city boundary as well. And hence the last sentence in paragraph 4.5 uh, stating that it's important that where existing uses are displaced by this approach that the new local plan provides opportunities for their relocation within the city. Um, other than that, I think the consultation responses are, are, are fairly straightforward and obviously we welcome the opportunity to comment on the emerging plan uh, as, as it progresses uh, through, through the process and no doubt there will be future consultations uh, to, to respond to in due course. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ed, for that. Um, does anyone from outside of the committee wish to speak at this time? No, so we'll come straight into committee and Councillor Ellen Ryan, we'll start with you. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, Ed. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, do you have any indication, I know this is going to sound a little paranoid, but roughly whereabouts they, they see the edge of the city developments occurring? I mean, I, I note that they say not in the hills to the north and northwest of the city, which I presume is the hills near Pinho and uh, looking over the X Valley. Um, but where do they, where are they planning? Do we have any idea? Um, because on the other side, it's quite boggy and wet. So just wondered. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Lawrence. We'll take a few more and then we'll, we'll bring Mr. Freeman in. So Councillor Bailey, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Ed for the report. Yes, I was also going to pick up on the, the comment about um, protecting the, um, the important landscape areas for the city, um, which I presume actually were probably Holden. Um, and I am slightly concerned that it's going to be directing it east into our direction. Um, so I, I wonder whether we should be actually making a comment. I mean, I, you know, if, if X to have Growth, growth aspirations, that's very much, that's fine. That's an aspiration for, for Exeter. But I, I want to be clear that um, if, if there's an aspiration um, to send it east because of a landscape impact on Holden, then I think that is a matter of concern um, for, for East Devon District Council. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Ed, can I bring you in? Both very similar questions. So I think we can cover those off pretty quickly. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, well, the City Council are not uh, consulting at this stage on any specific sites. They obviously will be in, in due course um, as, as their plans progress. So I don't have any insider knowledge of, of particular sites they're looking at. Um, I, I could, however, refer members to the Livable Exeter document that the City Council published, I think, in 2019, uh, which does give a clear indication of some of the sites they were looking at in terms of that programme, uh, some of which, if I recall, were, were redevelopment. On, on the edge of the city. Um, so that um, gives an indication. I don't think they were specifically out on the east from memory, um, but might be worth looking at that document, which is, I know, is freely available on their website. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, Councillor Allen, over to you. Yes, thank you. Just uh, uh, to uh, look briefly at the um, aspirations in terms of uh, permeability of commuters because so many of the uh, people from Exmouth, Honiton and, and Cranbrook travel in for work and there's always constant problems in terms of um, M5 access through the various uh, uh, different uh, nodes and it doesn't seem to figure very highly this connectivity aspect to their vision I think a lot of the work that they've been doing has been very focused on sustainable transport within the city. 
but I think we perhaps need to put a marker down that we need a, a serious infrastructure plan jointly developed. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Allen. And, and Ed, just coming back to you quickly on that, is that, is that something that obviously we can highlight, but it would mainly be for, for Devon County to, to start coming forward with their, their transport infrastructure demands and what they believe that obviously coming out of our new local plan, uh, as well as what, what, what will occur from, from Exeter's local plan, what the actual transport infrastructure demands will be for the, for the county. Uh, yes, I certainly uh, agree that that's something that needs looking at in terms of the transport infrastructure in and out of the city. Um, obviously, we, we were working together through through GESP and we'll do through uh, the non-statutory strategic plan that's also being worked up, which is looking at infrastructure demands. Um, if members were minded to, we could include some wording into the response to question three about the vision to just highlight that issue. Um, but as, as you say, Chair, it, it, it's um, something we need to work up jointly with the City Council and, and very much with Devon County Council as, as the, the provider of much of the infrastructure that we rely on to get in and out of the city. Thank you very much. Councillor Howe, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to back up first what was spoken about first regarding development coming our way. Um, the one thing in their comments and everything else they don't pick up on the Cliffs Valley Regional Park, which is a important wildlife habitat just this side of their border that they should have due regard for, particularly as we've statutory put it down as, as one of our policies for the future and enacting now. So I do believe we all need to give them a cautionary tale to say, this is here, you shouldn't be harming wildlife or anything else this side of the river. Um, or this side of the M5, I should say, but mainly over here. The second one was picking up Mike Allen's point as well um, on highways, particularly, you know, slightest accident on, well, hell, anywhere in Exeter and the whole of the city and the motorway and all our roads around come to an absolute gridlock. So I do think we need to highlight the issues, even though they know them. Um, but nevertheless, it would be reminiscent of us not to highlight those issues again and say extreme work is needed particularly around junction 30 of the m5 um they need extra capacity getting in and out of the city etc 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 to alleviate some of these silly problems that happen whenever anyone has a broken car down on x bridges it's as simple as that thank you thanks very much for that councillor howe councillor ingham over to you uh, thank you chair three things um in line with what others have said roads uh, in my opinion, uh, in my opinion, uh, Devon County Council, with the help of Exeter City Council, have managed to trash in 50 years what the Romans provided sustainability for for 1,900 years. Uh, and this gridlock, uh, traffic gridlock, uh, within and around Exeter, of uh, others have mentioned, it, it is a top priority, I think, for the long term. Uh, uh, credibility and sustainability of Exeter. Flats, um, they do mention that they would like to uh, consider, you know, brownfield sites in the centre of Exeter. Um, if we're going to address the Devon Climate Emergency Strategy, then perhaps we have to consider that uh, in stronger terms and uh, uh, prov providing tower blocks in the center of Exeter to reduce commuting and uh, not just brownfield sites as they become vacant. Uh, perhaps they need to uh, be a bit more positive than that. I'll leave that to your imagination. And uh, Councillor Rylance was quite right, you know, with regards to the hills. I remember it was a good 10 years ago that Exeter was saying, uh, well, of course, uh, we won't be building on the, uh, the the hills that surround the city. How convenient for them. Uh, and that was pronounced at a time when we weren't all signed up to the Devon uh, Climate Emergency Strategy Chair. Uh, I, I think they have to think again and they have to be uh, far more uh, proactive in, in what they do within their plan. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Lee. Um, so uh, I don't really know what the best way to, to deal with this might be is, do we have specific, um, well, do we want to 
um, insert specific wording in for the questions that we've seen, or is it the fact that we want to just give a steer to, to Mr. Freeman on obviously the, the points that we've already raised? Councillor Howe. I personally am quite happy and knowing Ed's eloquent way of wording things, um, happy for Ed to take away our advice and uh, would hope to see that those words put into action by the policy response. I can see no point in us coming up with the words for Ed. He knows very well what game everyone has to play and he knows very well what we want to see and how to put it into words. So I'm quite happy to move that. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Howes. That's a proposal. Can I just have a seconder for that, please? I'm happy to second that, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Arnott. You still have your hand up. Do you have anything you wish to add? Almost word for word what Councillor Howes just said. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, with that in mind, Mrs Shaw, welcome to the meeting. Can you please take us to a vote? Yes, Chair. Members, the recommendation is that Strategic Planning Committee note the proposed response to Exeter City Council local plan <coughs> issues consultation um, with comments raised following discussion at committee. Members, please press your green tick if you're in support of that recommendation, press your red cross if you're against that recommendation, or raise your electronic hand if you are indicating you are abstaining from the vote. So, Chair, I can tell you that you have 10 votes in favour. Oh, uh, an extra one just snuck in. 11 votes in favour, no votes against, and I have no abstention. So that's carried. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to agenda item eight, site promoter presentations to the Strategic Planning Committee. And again, it's over to Mr. Freeman to present his report. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so members will recall um, a report that was brought to you at your meeting on the 27th of April this year, um, considering options for how we engage with site promoters and developers through the local plan preparation process. Uh, members resolved at that meeting that they would like to do that in a very open and transparent way through presentations made at a special meeting of the Strategic Planning Committee uh, at that time to be held in November. So what would have been this meeting? Um, and a uh, delegated authority was given to officers uh, in consultation with the chair to uh, work up details of how that would, meeting would, would operate. Um, as things have progressed, members will be aware that we've had a huge number of sites come forward through the HELAR process. Um, and um, I think 359 uh, comes to mind as the number. Um, and the HELAR panel um, uh, has been slightly delayed uh, because of that and uh, arrangements being set up such that um, we don't have that hasn't that work hasn't been completed as as yet. Um, the other factor I think to consider is on on reflection. Um, I think it's perhaps uh, more helpful for members to hear the presentations in the context of a, a sort of discussion around the strategy for growth, uh, which I think will be prompted at the December meeting when the working draft of the local plan is, is presented to you. Um, so I think we're now uh, proposing that that meeting with uh, presentations from developers and site promoters actually takes place in January. Um, so asking for members uh, uh, agreement to that change in timetable. Um, and then we've started to look in more detail about the format and organisation of that meeting, um, conscious of making the best use of, of members' time. Um, conscious that we've, we've had about 10 or 12 parties already express an interest in, in presenting at that meeting. Um, there may well be others um, that will come forward. Um, so the report kind of talks about how we might look at running that meeting, um, how we could potentially um, seek to rationalise some of the presentations um, if we have too many people wanting to present and can't accommodate that within a single meeting. Clearly, there's an option to have additional meetings if members just want to hear from, from any developer or site promoter who wants to present. But should members wish to rationalise the list of presenters, there are options around um, how officers have scored those sites um, so that we preclude sites that are, are, are perhaps uh, very unlikely to be viewed favourably because they're large scale development in an area of outstanding natural beauty or, or perhaps development in an area at high risk of flooding. Um, 
or equally, um, you know, they could be rationalised on on the basis of the size of sites. So members are focused on hearing presentations from the larger scale sites rather than necessarily the smaller scale sites. Um, so there are various options there if members wish to rationalise uh, the list of presentations such that it can be accommodated in a single meeting, or we could have numerous meetings. Um, the, the the proposal that's really before you is a list of bullet points. I think on page 21 of the agenda, I, I, we tend to think as officers that the best approach is to keep to a single meeting, but that this be a full day meeting um, and that we provide sort of 20 minute slots per site um, and require developers and presenters to, to register with us beforehand. So that uh, amounts to a seven hour day uh, with a maximum of 20 presentation slots. Um, and uh, that if demand exceeds that number of slots, we look to uh, rationalise that in relation to the, the scoring uh, system that we'll be using, uh, which you'll see when we present the, the working draft of the plan to you in December. We've scored um, all of the sites that have come forward on a scale of one to six. Um, so we would then, if numbers exceeded what was available, look to um, cut that down based on uh, taking out the lowest scoring sites from that list. Um, as the meeting will be taking place in January, it could potentially take place um, in person, but uh, we actually feel that given that no decisions would be, need to be made at that meeting, that perhaps holding it virtually uh, again would, would be advantageous in terms of uh, those wishing to present as well. Um, in terms of many of them will come from other parts of the country. Um, so reducing everyone's carbon footprint by being able to dial in and do it virtually would seem to make sense. Um, so those are the proposed arrangements. Members' views are sought particularly on if they wish to, to rationalise the list of speakers and, and presenters, and if so, how. Um, otherwise, members' views are, are, are sought on the arrangements as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Mr. Freeman. Um, Councillor Howe, you, you did say to me ahead of the meeting that you wish to speak on this agenda item, so if we can go to you first. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for your indulgence. Um, I need to talk on this one, and I will be hopefully talking on the last agenda item as well, about sewerage, unfortunately. Um, and I did phone Mr Freeman this morning just to advise him of what I was going to say and or coming from. Um, Part of my ward, Clis St Mary, um, suffers very badly with sewage issues. Um, we had a very constructive meeting with Southwest Water um, last week, which the highlight of uh, the Blue Ball pumping station, which pumps all the sewage from Cranbrook, um, West Cliss Developments, Tyburn, Science Park, um, everything in the West End, basically, Sky Park Development and everything else, is over capacity, it can't cope. The consequence of this is 11 times in the last, well, this year, it's not even finished this year yet, my village has flooded with sewage. We've had residents who can't use their toilets for 60 plus hours at a time. This is being increased because of development upstream for obvious reasons. Now, these developers and, and Ed's reasoning is quite sound apart from the fact we should not be accepting any further development until southwest water can accommodate the sewerage they cannot object because in 2018 the law was changed they are the connection of last resort so our planning system has to take into account the sewerage issues now thankfully to, uh, to simon jupp our mp here I've got a meeting with him, with the CEO of Southwest Water on Monday. And at that point, I hope to get a letter formally from Southwest Water to East Devon, telling them of the woes of the pumping station. It is not an easy fix, any of their solutions. And believe me, I've got a map, not much help, but nevertheless a map of what they're looking at and some of their solutions. To the extent of one of their solutions is they will provide portable camping type toilets to the residents because they have no toilets they can use. That is the scenario we're at. And my proposal currently on this is that any development in the West End 
should not be brought forward until this is sorted. And as such, we should not be entering into discussions with them until a firm final proposal, which could be 10 years out, is sorted and implemented to stop the current issues, let alone the further issues, if we allow further development to happen in the West End. Um, so, and if Ed wants a, wants a recommendation for me, then I would quite easily say, if you're in the West End in any of those areas and your sewage goes to the blue ball pumping station, you will instantly start with a minus three on your scorecard for the HELA. That might even give us a chance. Actually, I'll go minus six, but nevertheless, you can only score six, so they get to zero. But I, I'm happy with a minus three. But certainly at this point, I cannot support us even entering discussions with developers when there is no known solutions or possibility of solutions that uh, are readily available to solve the issues of sewage in this area. Um, so I ask committee to consider this information and I'm happy to furnish further information, obviously after meeting the CEO of Southwest Water on Monday um, and see where we go from there. But I wholeheartedly cannot support any further development. And in fact, I'm here actually asking us, asking Mr. Freeman if we can withdraw from the Cranbrook expansion investigation, um, uh, uh, not uh, the Cranbrook expansion. expansion that's currently with the planning inspectorate at present, because none of those sites should be allowed to be developed until Southwest Water has solved their problems. It is that serious. Now, there might be a miracle, they might fix it next year. Or worst cases, they've got to dig up underneath the motorway all the way down um, through Counters Weir, the road and the bridge there, and also dig all the way from here to God knows where, Hunterton, Clist, Cranbrook and everywhere else and put new sewers in. Put a new sewage treatment plant at Hill, um, Hunterton, Clist. That might be the solution. But none of these are on the cards at present. They all need to be done. They all need to be costed and they all need to be proved before another house is allocated to be built, not alone built and connected. So committee, I ask for your indulgence. I ask for your careful thoughts. And we do need to hold Mr. Freeman and don't get me wrong, Mr. Freeman knows I'm not having a go at him, but we do need to be extremely careful about what we're doing to residents who are suffering these sewage problems and not make them any further worse than they already are. Um, so. Committee, over to you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Howell. I, I think my my only worry would be that if we then say we say no to, to any form of development, that then uh, it, it comes that even we lose our five-year land supply, and then there's more, even more yeah. more <laughs> undesirable development comes through, and predominantly it will happen in the West End. If you look at our our existing local plan three quarters of the development is all allocated towards the West End, so. Well, yeah, but that is the issue we have, but we should not, and by law, I don't believe we can make the situation worse. Mm. Don't get me wrong, I, I get, Mr. Ed, I'm sure we'll, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Ed, Mr. Freeman will make the case that we can carry on and allocate these sites and everything else, but they should not be allowed to be built until this is solved, but we should be sending massive warning flags up to everybody these are reserve sites only if South Coast Water can resolve their problems. We cannot increase the problem. I mean, buying a house these days and not using your toilet 60, 60 hours, 11 times in a year, you just imagine, oh, don't worry, go and have an outside toilet put back in, a portable one. That's the solution. It's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. South Coast Water are working on it. Don't get me wrong. They've got an awful lot to play in this, but we need to be working with Southwest Water to understand their issues, understand the opportunities, and work out the phasing of further development if and when it happens further in the West End. But we cannot, in any reasonable context, allow this to continue. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Howell. Um, Ed, can I bring you in for your thoughts on, on the matter here, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I mean, obviously, the, the problem sounds horrendous and needs to be resolved, clearly. Um, that goes without saying. Um, I, I think what I would say, though, is um, that I, I would see 
not discussing future growth in that part of the district as, as actually counterproductive to finding the solution. Because Southwest Water will need to understand what our future growth plans are, are in that part of the district and plan for that. And, and planning for that could enable solutions um, such as new sewage treatment plant facilities, et cetera, that wouldn't otherwise be available. So they wouldn't, that will be the first question they will ask us when we engage with them, will be what are our future growth plans in that part of the district? And that is part of the planning process. We need to engage with all infrastructure providers, not just Southwest Water, about our growth plans and what implications that has for infrastructure. And I think across the district, um, members will probably all be able to cite infrastructure demands and issues in their wards that will need addressing for future growth to be accommodated. Um, and that is part of the conversations we need to have with infrastructure providers and ensure that where we are planning growth in those locations, that that infrastructure is provided in good time to meet the needs of that growth. Um, but ultimately, the local plan is for the next 20 years. Um, and as Council House says, a lot of this comes into the phasing of that growth, when and how it takes place. Um, to ensure that infrastructure can be provided in time. It's not necessarily going to prevent growth from being able to be accommodated. Um, and so it becomes just as important that we have those conversations with developers uh, and make decisions or provisional decisions at least about where growth can take place so that we can have those discussions with infrastructure providers, help them to understand where growth is potentially planned and understand what solutions may present themselves in terms of addressing those infrastructure demands and when that infrastructure can be provided so that we can accommodate that into our plans in, in, in to the local plan process. I would say in terms of Southwest Water, it is an interesting one in terms of how they are funded as well, um, because they have the ability, as I understand it, to levy charges um, under the legislation. Um, and some of their funding comes, I believe, through a sort of five yearly investment programme through government as well, um, and not through the development process. Um, so there are wider issues there that need investigation as well. Um, but uh, while I agree with Councillor Howe that the issue clearly needs to be resolved, um, we also have a lot of infrastructure issues across the district that also need to be resolved as well. Um, and not talking about growth, I actually think is counterproductive because once we know and understand where we will have, want to have growth in the future, then we can have sensible conversations with infrastructure providers. Um, until then, it's going to be difficult for Southwest Water to understand what solutions might present themselves if they don't understand where we're looking to accommodate growth and, and how much the future demand on their services will be. Um, hopefully that helps uh, Chairman for the moment, but happy to come back later if there are further issues. Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll move back outside of committee and Councillor Young, you want to, to come in next? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I've... <coughs> I share uh, Mike Howell's concerns on this sewage issue. I discussed it with him yesterday. I've been discussing uh, the issues with um, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Southwest Water and with Environment Agency for a number of weeks. Uh, the issue seems to be that surface water is mixing with sewage um, in the same pipe, and <coughs> the event. Uh, and uh, the events in uh, Clist Mary and in a lot of other places uh, like Limston. Um, uh, this, this is the effect of uh, underinvestment by Southwest Water and uh, the climate change with even more uh, storm events uh, generating a lot of uh, storm water going down the drains and then come bubbling up in the middle of the road, in uh, uh, which create a well, mighty stink, uh, very unpleasant, um, environmentally very unfriendly. Um, it, it is an issue not only uh, to do with uh, the West End and um, around my end of the district, it's, uh, it, it's an issue throughout uh, East Devon. Um, most sewage works are at capacity and the result of that during a storm event is that they have to uh, let sewage uh, uh, flow out. Uh, I had um, uh, local parish councillors tell me yesterday that Exton, there was a horrible stench in the ex-estuary. 
that is triple SI, um, highly uh, protected, and we've got raw sewage flowing out of the excess tree. Um, and now with climate change, um, predictions of uh, storm events are going to increase dramatically. Um, five inches of uh, water fell in a couple of hours uh, on uh, the uh, uh, otter catchment uh, last week, and that uh, caught the engineers out and left all their vehicles um, in the floodplain, unfortunately. Uh, but um, the, the combination of underinvestment by the uh, southwest water and uh, climate change means that we have got serious, serious problems with uh, sewage in our area. And I do share uh, uh, Mike Howe's um, uh, concerns on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And whilst I completely appreciate the issue, I think we do need to, just for, for subsequent members that are speaking, we need to bring this back to the agenda item itself, which is the site promoter presentation um, uh, and thoughts and recommendations on that, on that topic. Councillor Lawrence, you're up next. Sorry, Chair. I, I was just going to reiterate what Councillor Young said about the, the sewage. In, in Wimpool, we're the other side of Cranbrook, but we too have a severe problem. And I've been banging on to Southwest Water for five years now that every time we have moderate rainfall, it lifts the drain covers in the main street down through the village. We get fountains of sewage about two foot high and they're all running into a freshwater stream that runs through the middle of the village. Now, not only does it stink and it contains everything else that goes down toilets, but kids come home from school and they think it's funny because they're kicking water over each other and everything else. And it's absolutely disgusting in this day and age. And they, Southwest Water spent 360,000 hours discharging sewage in, into freshwater streams last year. And it's, it's got to stop. And, and they, they've known about Cranbrook, um, first two and a half thousand houses and then 4,000 houses since about 2005. But they've done nothing about it. Southwest Water haven't improved the situation at all since then. So, you know, to, to keep on giving more and more land for building more and more houses and, and, and not have the infrastructure to cope with it. I, I just think it's, it's totally unreasonable. Anyway, I've had my say, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Uh, I think if, if we are gonna just keep going down the route of Southwest Water, we either need to take it to a council meeting where you put forward a motion that we write to the CEO and shareholders. We need to get this, this meeting back to the agenda item in question, which is on the, the report that we've got in front of us. Absolutely, um, I apologize for that. No, no, no problem, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Miller, over to you. Yeah, I, I apologise, Chair, but really, um, this is an, a matter of urgency that Councillor Howe has raised, and it should. I'm not going to suggest that Councillor Howe shouldn't have mentioned it in this agenda item. Perhaps, you know, it's a little bit stretching because this is about presentations, but it is an item that I believe this committee should be discussing as a matter of urgency, and it should have been brought up at agenda item five. And the reason I'm coming in, and I apologize, Chair, I really apologize, because I know you need to get back to this, but this is such a serious issue. And Councillor Howe is meeting with the Chief Executive of Southwest Water um, in the next week. And I want to use my opportunity uh, that you've given me, that Councillor Howe does bring up this issue of underinvestment from Southwest Water. I would like him to. Because um, as members, as, as councillors will know, many councillors will know, there was an amendment that went into the House of Commons last night, um, a very sensible amendment about water companies taking all reasonable steps to reduce raw sewage discharge. And that amendment was voted down. And the government voted for a, for, for a, a motion that will do nothing i was going to swear that i'm very sorry I, I certainly won't but um it will do hard diddly squat to reduce uh, or, or at least to put any legal duty on water companies to um reduce discharge and i would like to know and i think council Howe is in a position to be able to inform the committee or the council about what southwest water's position is on this so i'm so sorry chair i understand we now need to get back to the issue but I do think this is such an important matter that affects the entire district and obviously Councillor Howe's ward as well, I was aware, 
that it does need debating. And I just wish that it had been brought up on agenda item five because the public would want to hear us debating this. Thank you, Chair. Totally agree, Councillor Miller, but uh, unfortunately we can only debate on the, the agenda items in front of us today. Um, Councillor Brewster Sarum, can we please avoid Southwest Water, please? I, I promise I won't. Thank you, Chair. I promise I won't mention that. Um, I was going to say that I think that site scoring is the key, um, as Mr. Freeman uh, d mentioned just now. And, and I think that uh, obviously that's something we need to sort out if we're to have this meeting, um, because clearly the sites that do score uh, highly, we may need to give more than 20 minutes to them. So I think we need to go through it very finely at a meeting to ascertain how many presentations we want. Uh, and if necessary, give, give more than the allocated 20 minutes, um, because clearly some, some sites will be more, more worthwhile than others. And obviously, if we are being constrained in accordance with the AONB and the beauty and the funding, etc., then clearly that's something very positive. So those are my very mild comments. And um, I must also end by congratulating Councillor Howe on his most efficient use of, use of time with the meeting. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Tassar. Councillor Rylance, over to you. Thank you, Count Chair. Um, mindful of avoiding South, Southwest Water, although I completely agree with everything Councillor Howe has said. Um, could Mr Freeman please uh, remind us what the, what the tariff is for um, a, a judging sites? Um, I know it's on a one to six. Does, does the provision of the advanced provision of infrastructure form part of this tariff? Um, and what would push a site down from a three to below a three? Because we, I mean, we need to know what we're not going to be shown, so to speak. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Rylance. We'll just take Councillor Arnott next and then we'll go to, to Mr Freeman. Councillor Arnott, over to you. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I was just going to say uh, how much I agree with the, uh, the, the meeting process that's suggested, which is effectively to do it on Zoom. And that makes sense from all of the councillors and, uh, and indeed the uh, developers, the presenters' point of view. Um, so that very much has my support, but, but, you know, especially also, as we know, that COVID is amongst the council membership at the moment. Um, and I would add... Chair, without even mentioning the word sewage or southwest water, that I do wish, with massive respect to Mike Howe, that um, he'd flagged this to all of us some time ago. I do think, given the MP's um, um, difficulties with his voting record um, in the last week or so on these matters, all courtesy, Mike, Councillor Howe, would have Councillor Young, Councillor Ledger, me, you, Mr. Jupp, and the CEO of South East Southwest Water meeting. I do think that, and I think it's, um, I, I, I might seek from you afterwards an explanation as to why, given it's such a massive planning issue, it is just you and Mr. Jupp. I'm not very happy with that. I don't often say things like that. But as perhaps the SOP, and I, I hope this may please you, Chair, as well, what I will say to Councillor Howe is if you wish to put forward a motion to Council along the lines of the excellent series of speeches which you've given today on this slightly inappropriate agenda item, I will happily second that. So I ask you, if you want to put forward a motion to Council about this incredibly serious issue of whether we have the infrastructure to cope with, those words I'm not going to mention, um, I will second it for you. So I'll put that ball back into your call. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnold. Councillor Ingham, over to you. Thank you, Chair. I, I uh, agree with the idea of a, a preliminary one day, seven hour session where we listen to say 20 developers. Uh, but I don't like the idea of rationalizing uh, you know, the, the, the uh, democratic process. Look, when we do local plans, um, they take a long time, they last a long time. And I think the public will expect us to um, give um, every opportunity uh, to councillors to make the right decisions on selecting those sites. That's why I say, yes, by all means, prioritise those developers uh, given an opportunity to present on day one, but there really should be a day two. 
uh, you know, whether that's just a morning or an afternoon or a whole second day. Uh, and, and yes, there, there, there will be a cutoff point, but we have to make absolutely sure we get this right. Because as, as Mr. Freeman will tell you, at some point, the inspector will say, did you follow due process? Did you give every opportunity for the right considerations to be made? And if you edit those um, uh, sites uh, coming forward and restrict the number that we're uh, allowed to consider and decide, th then I believe we make ourselves vulnerable. Uh, and uh, thank you, Chair. I, I won't uh, discuss the incompetence of Southwest Water or their failure to meet their commitments over the last 30 years on the River X. Thank you. Appreciate you not mentioning it, Councillor Ingham. Um, to, to be honest, I, I totally agree. I think it, a lot of emphasis through planning policy gets put on um, SMEs through the development process. And yet we're, we're talking of a report today where we are discounting them really due to the size of the sites that are going to come forward through them. Um, so I, I would like to give them more, well, if not the same way, it shouldn't just be the fact that these larger sites, uh, because they're larger and they're going to deliver a larger yield, that we should give them any more 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 time than others. Um, Councillor Bailey, we'll come to you next. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was going to mention this on item five, um, and that obviously, I'm sorry, does relate to sewage, but as we've touched on it, I will continue very briefly. Um, I would certainly hope that whoever goes to that meeting, um, they invite Southwest Water to our scrutiny committee. That's a suggestion that I put forward um, at the cabinet. I think it's really important. There's obviously so much interest and concern about what's being discharged into our rivers, including the River Otter. Um, I was gonna raise this item at um, agenda item, I think it's five, because I, whilst I understand um, uh, what Mr. Freeman says about not, you know, holding back um, the process. Surely we can have some robust policies in our local plan relating to sewage. So, for instance, in Cornwall, as I understand it at the moment, um, due to high phosphate levels in the rivers, um, there's been a pause on granting further planning permissions. So whilst I would hope that we could certainly have a report from Mr. Freeman advising us what we can put in our, our local plan um, to protect um, uh, our, our waterways. And actually, yes, it is really quite outrageous. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Bailey. And Ed, I don't really want to put words into your mouth, but it does come down to the five year land supply and land availability, does it not? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, certainly those are, are, are big considerations. But as I said before, I, I, I do feel that we need to have conversations with developers and Southwest Water about future growth plans, because that can impact on what the solutions to these problems are. If, if they're designing a solution just based around dealing with the current capacity issues, then that's, that's one thing. But if, if we're saying as local planning authority that we want to plan for X, hundreds if, if not thousands of homes that might discharge into that sewage treatment plant then they're going to need to think bigger in terms of solutions at which point Southwest Water need to be aware of that at the earliest opportunity um, and so stopping our discussions about potential sites and development coming forward in that area to my mind is just counterproductive uh, we need to give them be able to give them the big picture so that they can come up with a big picture solution um, but obviously in the meantime, uh, we also have our own <laughs> constraints about delivering our housing numbers uh, and, and progressing the local plan as well. Um, and, and you're right, those uh, are, are the good reasons to, to keep progressing our work and, and keep talking about uh, development options across the whole district, regardless of these constraints. Albeit we need to understand them and discuss them with infrastructure providers uh, in due course as well. Um, uh, with your indulgence, Chairman, I was going to answer Councillor Rylance's question as well uh, about the scoring of individual sites. I mean, I, I think it's difficult to, to take account of these issues when it comes to individual site scoring, because fundamentally from uh, Southwest Water's perspective, it's the amount of discharge into a particular sewage treatment plant that's the issue. So that's not just one site, that's the accumulation of a number of sites 
Um, and, and so um, we need to understand what that uh, volume, if you like, for want of a better word, uh, of discharges is likely to be to then go and have conversations with Southwest Water uh, about what um, the solutions might be, what they, the demands on their services are likely to be in the future. There is usually always a technical solution. Um, it is just a, a matter of designing a solution and funding it. Um, I say that as if it's simple, it's clearly not. Um, it's, it's very complicated and very important. Um, but um, I, I come back to my point about stopping discussions about future growth aspirations just doesn't um, help with those conversations, to my mind, as well as the other problems it causes us as, as local planning authority moving forward. Um, but in terms of the question and, and site scoring, it, it doesn't really feature because it's a cumulative, cumulative impact of a number of sites that will impact on, on this. So the site scoring is, is very much about site specific issues, uh, at least at this stage, but we will be engaging with infrastructure providers in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Ed. Uh, Councillor Blakey, over to you next. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to try to stick to the, <laughs> the agenda item and just say as regards to the meeting format, I think it's generally quite sensible, except that um, I think that, as Councillor Desarum has already pointed out, there are likely to be some, um, some overruns on some of the more um, contentious sites. Um, and I think that it might be a good idea, frankly, if we were to start the day somewhat earlier. I can't understand the reason for a 10 o'clock kickoff, uh, particularly if we were going to be doing this virtually, um, if an entire day is going to be allocated towards it, <clears throat> why not start at nine o'clock or earlier to, um, to make allowance for some, some extra time to deal with uh, potential overruns? And obviously the, 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 there is time at the, the end of the day, but seven hours, I, kn I know it makes it a tough day and eight hours would therefore be tougher, but surely we can allocate a little bit more time to this. It's, it's a, a, a huge issue um, and I think we need to allocate as much time as is reasonable towards it. So that, as I say, there may be a good reason for a 10 o'clock start, but I can't think of it. And I will try not to mention the fact that um, Southwest Water is actually the major business part of Pennon Group PLC, um, which as a public limited company has its primary um, responsibility to its shareholders, not to its customers. Um, and uh, therefore funding and investment is always going to be tricky. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Blakey. And again, I appreciate you not mentioning it. Councillor Allen, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> looking at the uh, proposal, I think that the idea, <clears throat> sorry, is a very sensible way forward. <clears throat> I do think that it will probably need more than one day, uh, especially if we're knocking out any that don't reach uh, a, a high enough score. And there may be a need for some kind of um, process for people who are knocked out to come back and, and present why they should have been included. So I think that I'm largely in favour of what's been said. However, I do think both uh, Mike Howe and Ed Freeman are correct from their different viewpoints. We need to get a fix on what the overall picture is going to be. We need it as fast as possible. And we also need to make absolutely sure that we put in some form of policies that show a contingent restriction on developments that are going to disrupt the sustainability of any particular settlement. So those kind of things perhaps ought to be a consideration either for a main council meeting or for a special meeting or for the December meeting of the Strategic Planning Committee. We cannot build houses that are unsustainable. We have started to make that mistake, but the world is changing and we need to get it right. And we have a public duty to get it right. 
And I'm not prepared to be driven by an arbitrary figure that the government wants to impose on us without a big fight to make sure we get the right infrastructure in place first. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Allen. Um, Councillor Bailey, we'll come to you next. Thank you. I think maybe uh, Mr. Freeman might have misunderstood what I was saying. Um, I'm not talking about uh, stopping discussions about future growth aspirations, or either I wouldn't probably use that, that wording. Um, what I'm talking about is having a report for the Strategic Planning Committee, which sets out what policies we can have in our new local plan to protect the seas and rivers and also to protect the residents, such as those who... Um, uh, Councillor Howe has highlighted who already have problems with their sewage. So I'd like to put forward a proposal that we have a report on that, please. No problem at all. Councillor Bailey, can you just incorporate it into the report that we're, we're already on as well? So that it's a joint up motion. So that we don't end up having to have two motions, for, well, two proposals for, for one agenda item. I'm not quite sure what you mean. So right now, your your proposal doesn't deal with the agenda item that we're we're dealing with currently. So if no. you incorporate both to your proposal, that it comes back with another report, but that we, for instance, agree the report or whatever you, you wish to to add from the the debate for today. But it needs to have, be all encompassing for the agenda item that we're on. Can I? Do it at the next that I would have done something like that on the whatever the agenda item is that but it's kind of got drawn into this specific agenda item where it doesn't actually naturally sit with it. So do you want to bring it up at the next agenda item under climate change? Is that, I think that so. would probably yeah. be easier? Yeah, I think. thank you. No problem. Councillor Howe, we've started with you and I think we're going to finish with you as well. I don't know about that, but I've got two parts to this and I will come back to sewage in a second. But first, on the bullet points and everything else, um, I personally want to see the middle ranking. Those that score six, you know, they're top of the tree. Are we really interested? I, yes, we ought to see them, see the sites and everything else. But I'm more interested in those on the middle of the rung that are, yes, we might do them or no, we might, because that's where the more tricky decisions I expect need to be so i like like others i think one day is too short i think we need to listen to everybody two days quite possibly um and i certainly want to drill down more to those in that middle ground particularly if they're smaller developers that offer alternatives to the majors um because i want our own grown industry getting stronger here you know keeping the money in the east Devon district southwest if necessary go a bit further but nevertheless I want local builders involved in smaller capacities and as such smaller sites. So I'm more in that middle ground of wanting to see more of those middle runners than the, just the top runners all the time, because I really do think if it's, if it scores six, we're going to be hard fought to fight against it. If it's scoring four and five or even three, possibly going down that low, then there's choices to be made. And I think that's where we need to be concentrating our efforts. Coming on from that, and this is going back to sewage, um, and, and picking up Mr. Freeman's point and yours, Chair, the whole point of this is if Southwest Water turn around and say they can't fix this problem, you're going to have to allocate development elsewhere anyway. And that's the fundamental I'm trying to tell you is any such allocation sites have to have that caveat on them to say if we can't solve these sewage problems, we need to think differently, alternatively or elsewhere. And that is the caution we ought to be using in this assessment of what the risks are. It's not just whether they can access a highway, it's whether they can safely and in the future access a safe sewage network as well as power, as well as, well, gas is out now, gas is, gas is going to exist, etc. All the other facilities that needs to be on a development. So I come back to that. Um, I do need to address Councillor Arnott, um, the leader, obviously, this is my ward that started this. We had a meeting with the director of Southwest Water where the full implications finally came out only last week. 
Um, and from there, being as my ward is the lowest in the sewer run, if you get my meaning, I urgently asked for a meeting with the CEO of Southwest Water through Simon Jupp, because he's heavily involved as well, as far as I'm concerned. Now, you know, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to uh, put a motion to full council, council on it, and if we can speak afterwards, I'm more than happy to do that. And I'm happy to see if we can organise a meeting afterwards. But at present, I am... I only have three quarters of the facts and I want the full facts that affect my ward. And that was the whole implication for me going to see Southwest Water, the CEO, was to find the full facts and their plans as to what they hope to do to the future. And I fed this back to Ed months ago, Mr. Freeman, didn't I? Um, I warned you of what was going on, what was happening and everything else. So I'm sorry if I didn't invite everyone else, but at the time, Last week, that's how short it's been. I was more worried about my residents than the rest. But obviously, then when Southwest Water said it's due to development upstream, all of a sudden the wheels started to come off the wagon as I guessed it would. But um, we'll see. Um, I believe Simon Jupp, our MP, is already speaking to see if he can reorganise a meeting. But we'll, uh, I'll come back to you after, Councillor Arna, if that's necessary. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Howe. It's Councillor Arnold, over to you. Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Just to thank Councillor Howe for that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, so, Councillor Howe, were you putting forward a proposal there previously? At the start, you, I think you did, and then you moved back into sewage. Yeah, no, no. I, yeah, I, I, I am happy to move a proposal that we look for two days to accommodate the most of the development we can and as I say I think we need to be looking at the more middle runners that are acceptable for development um, but not scoring the highest because they should in theory be a no-brainer but at the same time I will be critical obviously of any developer that wishes to develop upstream and not provide their own sewage works etc sorry thanks very much um could I please get a seconder for that happy to second chair Thank you, Councillor Arnott. So with no other speakers, we'll take that to a vote and it's over to you again, Mrs Shaw. Thank you, Chair, yes. Um, members, you have the recommendation that members note officers will proceed for arrangements for a special strategic planning committee meeting to hear presentations from developers and site promoters of sites being considered for allocation in the new local plan on the basis of the details given in the report. And as discussed in the meeting, with a preference for two days to accommodate most sites and in, to include the middle runners for review of sites by members. Members, please press your green tick if you're in support of the recommendation. Press your red cross if you're against the recommendation or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. And for the benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place. I'll just give it a few more moments. And Chair, I have 10 in support, no votes against and no abstentions. So that is carried. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. And thank you to the committee. So we move on to the next agenda item, which is on coastal change. It's pages 22 to 43. And again, it is over to Ed Freeman to present his report. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, so this report follows on from a report that the committee received in October 2020, um, setting out the national approach to coast change and advising members of work that was underway by Plymouth University to help us to map coastal change in the district. Uh, members will recall that um, that work was being uh, done on the basis of um, the work needed from a local planning authority perspective and is quite distinct from work being undertaken by the council's coastal protection authority. Um, so this work is, is very much taking a precautionary approach um, and is looking at how we can avoid development in vulnerable areas and not increase the rate of coastal change. Uh, so the topic paper before you today um, considers those issues in, in the context of the shoreline management plan and provides an update on work being undertaken, as I say, by University of Plymouth to map the remaining of our uh, coast in relation to coastal change. Um, and we hope that work will be completed by early next year. 
The report then goes on to consider potential policy responses, considering best practice that's been adopted elsewhere, including at North Norfolk, East Riding and Waveney, when different approaches have been taken to restricting development according to uh, the time periods in which change is likely to occur. Um, and the use of uh, measures like coastal erosion vulnerability assessments through the planning application process to help to assess the risk of individual proposals. Um, the relocation of uses affected by coastal change is also highlighted as a potential area where policy could be applied uh, to enable an approach to perhaps uh, make it easier for uses in coastal change areas to be relocated to areas at lower risk of coastal change uh, through, through the policies uh, in, in the new local plan. Um, so members' views are, are, are sought on, on the various options that are detailed um, in the report uh, and the topic paper uh, attached. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Freeman. So, members, do you wish to discuss? Councillor Ledoon, over to you. Chair, thank, yes. thank you. <laughs> Was it me? Yeah, over to you whenever you're ready. Sorry, I, I, I had a I had a, a, a momentary lapse of concentration. So forgive me, I, I've got a question, actually. Uh, and I suppose I ought to make before I ask the question, I ought to make a declaration that I'm a ward member where part of my ward actually um, goes down to the coastline. Um, and therefore, this is obviously an interesting um, um, issue for me. So. Uh, my question really is what effect would having uh, an additional uh, part of uh, a uh, report from Plymouth uh, University, as they've already done for part of our coastline, have on the um, future values of developments, existing developments and properties uh, 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 on, on affected on, on the coastline? And the reason I ask this, uh, and I can see Mr. Friedman uh, scrabbling for his papers, is that as he will be aware, those of us uh, in, in who are Sidmouth um, area members have uh, a, a resident who likes to have regular correspondence with us on a matter of, uh, a number of issues. And one of the things that he has raised uh, most recently is, is two things. One that basically the Plymouth University approach uses an algorithm rather than empirical data and secondly um, raises the question about whether such reports as Plymouth would and have produced would fundamentally reduce the value of existing developments and properties and therefore that would be unhelpful um, to our to our residents and I'd just be interested in either either yours and or Mr Freeman's uh, comments uh, uh, upon this because obviously you know, when I receive something like that, I have to I have to take it seriously. And, and frankly, I don't have an answer to it. I think what we need to the, the Plymouth University, and it's been stated previously when when the topic was discussed last, was that this is a worst case scenario. Uh, and that's what we're doing from a planning point of view, is we are looking for the worst case. We're not looking for the most probable. We are looking for the worst case scenario over that time period. Um, and Mr. Freeman, would you would you disagree with anything like that? Uh, no, Chairman, uh, I think you're right. It's very much a precautionary uh, approach and quite an extreme precautionary approach as well. Uh, it's not uh, necessarily the most most likely approach. Um, so it's not intended to scaremonger. It's, it's intended to um, inform policy decisions about planning. Um, whereas other work's been done in the past to help to design coastal defences and things on, on a different basis, a different methodology. And that's that's fine. I don't see a problem with that. They're reports for two different purposes. Um, and I think um, this is where residents struggle to kind of separate that. But it's important that we keep that separation between the two pieces of work. In terms of property values, I, I would just add that um, you know, planning is not concerned with impacts on property values. That's not something that we can consider. So while I, I understand the concern, uh, that, that shouldn't be impacting on our work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that. Um, is that Thank a you, Chair. Thank you. 
Councillor Young, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, we, we do need to know what our coast is going to look like in 100 years, so we can then uh, recommend where houses are going to go or not go. Uh, that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, we are fortunate that most of our coast, um, where there is already housing uh, or development, um, there does not seem to be uh, too much issue with them disappearing into the sea just yet, uh, unlike areas that you uh, that uh, that Ed Freeman mentioned, uh, like in Norfolk and um, on the um, Humber Estuary and stuff. Um, we, we are fairly fortunate. Um, however, we, we have to look at some engineering solutions um, on um, at some of our towns, and that's why we're doing these beach management plans. Um, now, so we are basically considering holding the, what they term as holding the line um, uh, as the preferred option for uh, for our towns uh, along a coast. Um, there are some areas uh, along a coast where a managed realignment will happen, uh, similar to what has taken place on the uh, uh, lower Otto restoration project. But generally, um, th they are very limited. So there's now until we get the report uh, and and see the uh, exact line where the um, where, where uh, is proposed, uh, I, there's nothing to be concerned about at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Young. Councillor Miller, you're up next. Thanks, Chair. So obviously I've, I've read the uh, the report that is uh, in the appendix of the document. I can't say I understood very much of it, but that's because of my uh, B in GCSE geography, probably more than um, how good I'm sure the report is, but I'm learning from uh, Councillor Young since I've um, been elected chair as the e uh, Exmouth Beach Management Steering Group. And so my first question was probably actually based to Councillor Young. You just mentioned that most of the towns were um, had a whole the line policy. And I just wanted to check that Exmouth was definitely one of them, obviously, like Councillor Loud, and I'd like to declare an interest as part of my ward also uh, reaches the coastline. Um, and finally, in the conclusion of the, append of the document that we're um, considering at this point, it, uh, it states that given the complexities of the subjects and the potential impact on communities, it may be appropriate to develop supplementary planning guidance to support the local plan on our approach to and policies for coastal change. On on that point, and specifically on the wording of may be appropriate, from, um, from reading it, from reading the issues and trying to get to grips with this, it seems to me to be a necessity that we would develop supplementary planning guidance. But I wanted to ask Mr Freeman when that decision is likely to be made and, and how much more information we'll need before, before me, uh, making a decision on, on that or whether it would be one to be made today. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Miller. So, Ed, when will we have any SVDs, or have we had any in the past? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we haven't had any SVDs on this particular issue in, in the past. Um, supplement, supplementary planning documents are there to um, explain and expand on policy. So, um, to my mind, that decision would be made once we have the local plan and we know what policies we have in place to then understand what are the priorities in terms of SPDs to explain and expand on those policies. Um, so naturally, it needs to follow decisions on policy. Um, so that it, it, it's, it's probably still some way off um, whether or not members want to wait until we've adopted the local plan before deciding what SPDs are priorities or... Certainly, I would wait until we've submitted the plan for examination before giving serious thought to how we start working up SPDs. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Ed. Um, Councillor Davey, bring it back into committee now. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think this is a, a very useful and timely report. I, I also um, and uh, I declared my interest at the beginning as an Exmouth Town Councillor, and I, I should say that. Uh, that was particularly relevant uh, to this item as well. And um, I, I, I 
like the approach that's shown in, in some of the examples of best practice of using time scales to monitor the, the kind of development that we want to uh, allow there. But I do think we need to treat those with a bit of caution. And the, as Ed said, the um, Plymouth work is very much worst case scenario. Um, but we also need to be aware that the worst case scenario may actually be what we are dealing with. Almost every day there are news reports that show that climate change is happening faster and further and deeper than uh, even scientists in their worst case scenarios were predicting. So I think although I think it's useful to think of in terms of 25 year blocks, 50 year blocks, for the type of um, development that we allow in coastal areas, I think we need to be aware that uh, those timescales may actually be shorter than we think. Um, and uh, so I think it's a welcome approach, but I think we, we do need to be a little bit cautious there um, in uh, using those as though they're kind of set in stone. And I think the the same applies to to um, you know value of homes in in vulnerable areas as well. Uh, we we just need to be aware that things may change. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Davy. Councillor Howe, over to you. You're on mute. You might appreciate that or not. Shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> thank you. I, I I keep reading this and I'm. It's one of those things you just sit there and go, what are we going to do? There's loads of options here. Um, so I'm, I'm back to the square one. And Mr. Freeman is asking for our thoughts on this. And then we've not really got any details to give thoughts on. I mean, you know, Appendix 2 gives you loads of options of what we could be doing. But again, we should be coming back with planning policies, either supplementary or as part of our local plan as to how we're going to allow development in these areas. It's a great report. I'm just somewhat confused as to what Mr. Freeman wants from us. Um, because when you come to Exmouth and, you know, knowing Exmouth reasonably well, um, you know, you sit there and you look at the colonies and are we saying the colonies while defended, but has immense problems underneath uh, all the floorboards and everything else, should we walk away from the colonies? Blakeney, I think with the number of houses there and everything else, we can't. So, yeah. I am struggling with this and maybe it's just for noting, but it would be nice to know from Mr. Freeman what he wants us or what he's hoping to get out from us in this, on this agenda item. So over to Mr. Freeman, if you don't mind. Over to you, Ed. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose the report is is warming members up, shall we say, to, to this issue before we make um, firm recommendations, as we will in the working draft of the local plan that will be coming to you in December on, on this and a whole range of, of other issues. Uh, we were conscious we hadn't followed up on the previous topic paper that and, and gone as far as actually making presenting options, I suppose, about policy solutions. So really, um, all I'm looking for today is, is if members have a, a, a clear preference for one or more of the, the policy options presented in the paper that can inform uh, our production of the working draft of the local plan. If, if members don't have any firm preferences, it's, it's not the end of the world because we will make our own recommendation in, in the working draft of the local plan to your next meeting anyway. Um, but hopefully this is useful context to this issue uh, in, in any event and, and helps to start the debate. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that. Mr. Freeman, I think as well, you've just just reminded me. I do need to to highlight the fact of the next meeting to two members uh, present. The the working draft of the the local plan is already at three hundred and fifty plus pages. I think that's right, Ed. Um, and the next meeting in December will be an all day meeting. And so, just could you, as members, just leave enough and sufficient time so that you it can it can be accommodated. But Ed, I am right there. It's three hundred and fifty. Well, it's more probably now. I I think Chair, it was it was three hundred when I mentioned this to you. I think we're about three hundred and forty now. But um, <laughs> there may be some editing before then. Uh, but in any event, it's a sizable tome. So, Councillor Rylance, over to you next. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I believe it, it's the IPCC a few years ago that recommended that people no longer build on coastlines. So presumably they're adopting a, 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 an approach of um, no active intervention or possibly managed real, realignment for some cities. And they've also released a fair few maps of which major cities, most often built by next to, next to the seaside because of the ports that they, they depended on, um, being submerged by water by the end of the century. Um, I believe that we, it, it, I mean, it's going to look good, isn't it, to, to, to recommend that we, we protect towns. But ultimately, if the sea rises as much as, it's, as is looking quite likely at present, we won't be able to protect those towns. And we do have to wonder at the wisdom of allowing any further building near coastlines whatsoever. Um, on the subject of, of building codes, I know many countries employ different building codes um, within, within like spitting distance of the sea. So for example, you cannot have any living quarters on the, on the ground floor. You're only allowed to have a garage or a, a utility room on the ground floor and all living quarters should be above, above that. Um, I think there are maps, quite detailed maps available of where the water is likely to rise, which should also guide um, any development or redevelopment of any sites. Um, and I think we should be mindful um, that this information does exist and actually avoid giving planning permission to places which are likely to be underwater within the lifetime of the projected building. Because uh, the seas, we, we're not going to be able to stop the seas rising. They will rise. The question only at the moment is how much they rise by. Um, and I think we need to be a bit realistic about what we as a local authority can achieve, really. Um, and that may be quite an unpopular thing to say, but in the mean, there's going to be a sort of mean sort of interval where we can hold back the worst of it. But eventually we won't be able to anymore. And I think on the 100 year, you know, epoch, 50 to 100 year epoch, we're probably looking at, at retreat, by which time none of us sitting here will be still around, probably but we're still thinking about our children and grandchildren and what we're leaving to them. So I, I do believe that our strategies may be slightly different according to whether we're talking about, you know, 20 year, a 20 year timeline or a 50 plus timeline, because my personal opinion is we shouldn't be building anything that may not outlive the sea touching it. So we shouldn't be allowing building and cl close enough to the sea that it will be underwater within, within, the lifetime of the building, which for a house built these days is not all that long, given the building standards. And also we should be considering building codes if we are planning on even retreating towns to hire, to hire, um, to hire land. So it is possible to build a, a house which does not have any living quarters on the, first, on the ground floor. That's perfectly possible, it happen, happens all over the world. So maybe that's the sort of thing we should be considering if we are going to consider carrying on building nearest to the sea. Sorry to be a grim, miserable person, but there you go. Thanks very much, Councillor Rylance. Councillor Young, you want to come back in? Uh, thank you. Just grabbing your tea. Yeah, sorry, I was just having my cup of tea. Um, just to um, give some uh, reassurance to our Exmouth members, um, we do not uh, uh, consider that we'll be retreating Exmouth. Um, the, uh, the engineering that has been carried out on the Exmouth estuary and around um, the, the front of Exmouth, um, that's designed to protect Exmouth and the colonies for the next hundred years. Um, so, and that is for a one metre rise in um, sea levels, which is um, the, the highest level that the uh, environment uh, uh, agency consider is going to be the highest. So th there are ample protections at um, Exmouth at the moment. Um, and I don't think of any of our coast is, um, is vulnerable to uh, flooding. Um, there's more issues of um, uh, uh, erosion through uh, cliff falls and stuff like that than there, there is uh, from uh, uh, low level flooding. Um, so uh, just to confirm to residents and to our Exmouth res residents, um, we, we don't envisage any realignment uh, at Exmouth. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. Councillor Arnold, you want to come in now? 
Thank you very much, Chair. Never like to in any way even faintly disagree with Councillor Young. I, I, I must just point out to Councillor Young that Councillor Hartnell uh, would uh, be able to tell us that his seat in WH Smith, not WH Smith, his seat in post office only a couple of weeks ago was flooded. Um, now, I know these are unusual events with a uh, mixture of tide and uh, what's coming off the hills and so forth. Um, but my, my but, but absolutely take what uh, Councillor Pim said about Exmouth, of course. Um, Chair, I mean, two things have led me to one question, which I, I, I'd really love you to allow me to ask to, to, uh, to Ed. First of all, everything, and I'm not going to say anything about it, that's just been said about places you really shouldn't build until the sewage is sorted out. And now what we know about areas of coast where you'd be insane to build, um, either because it's so low lying that it is very unlikely it could be protected for very long. And we've seen in the matters of North Norfolk and uh, Graveney and all these other places, you know, people are having to effectively consider changing planning policy or even retreating um, you'd be bonkers to build uh, any houses anywhere near a cliff top across most of East Devon um, and so my question is chair given that we already can't build in the AOMB we're going to have problems which with huge respect I say councillor Howard pointed out to us today with areas that simply aren't sustainable in terms of sewage as councillor lawrence has said bubbling up through the through the streets as well and given that we know we may have difficulty building along parts of our coastline however high they are whether they're on the cliff or at low level do that does that combination of factors give us the ability to go back and in some way renegotiate the housing need numbers for east devon that, that's the question chair and i know it's a huge one and probably very unwelcome but i'd love just to kind of you know just a sort of where we stand um, from, from Mr. Freeman, if possible. Thanks very much. Ed, I'll throw that straight over to you because I think you're, you're going to answer it with a one, one word answer. Um, I'm not aware of any authority that has successfully gone back and uh, proven that it can't meet uh, the need identified by uh, the standard method calculator. Um, I think we can meet our need. It's, it's a matter of um, acknowledging that we are a very constrained area um, and looking at the sites that are available um, and making perhaps some difficult decisions about how highly we score some of those sites that are in areas that are available and not constrained by AOMB, coastal erosion, etc. Um, and possibly accepting things that we may not have accepted in the past in terms of uh, landscape impact, for example, um, on unprotected landscapes and things like that. Um, it's difficult in in this meeting, I think, to understand the extent of the issue and the potential solutions. These are obviously things we'll be presenting to you through the working draft of the local plan at the next meeting, at which point you'll be able to see the sites that have come forward, our scoring of them, the issues that arise from that and the potential solutions and compromises that might need to be made in order to meet our housing need. It can be done, but it's always going to be quite a compromise. Uh, I can't really, uh, I, I think it's probably a discussion for the next meeting when you've got the working draft of the plan in front of you and, and can understand all of the issues, but it's certainly going to be a difficult compromise, I think. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Um, Councillor Howe, you're coming in with a proposal, I see. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, really, it is just that. It, it's it's great report. Thank you. Noted. Please take our thoughts of the committee on board, Mr Freeman, and come back with the policies needed to reflect those thoughts. And so we can have a proper debate around it and move forward. Um, so I wholeheartedly just recommend those few words, shall we say. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Arnott's already stretching to second it, I'm sure. Second it, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs Shaw, can you take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Members, Strategic Planning Committee has considered the attached coastal change topic paper and provided feedback to inform the development of coastal change policies in the draft local plan. 
please, when um, press your green tick if you're in support of that recommendation, press your red cross if you're against the recommendation, and raise your electronic hand if you wish to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. And for the benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place. And Chair, I have 11 votes in support, no votes against and no abstention. So that is carried. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I think at this point we'll just take a five minute comfort break. I know the next agenda item might be a bit lengthy. So if we can just take a five minute comfort break and I will see you all at quarter to four. Thank you.
Are we ready to restart? Yep, ready when you are, Chair. I'll just take the slide down. Thanks very much, Deb. If members could put their cameras on as well, it would help. Perfect, thank you all. So we are moving on to agenda item 10, which is the local plan climate emergency policy approaches. And again, it is over to Mr. Freeman to present his report. I don't think Ed's quite back with us at the moment. Whenever you're ready, Ed, it's over to you to present your report. Apologies, Chairman, if I was late. <laughs> um, thank you, Chairman. So this report uh, seeks to um, set out some clear approaches to addressing the climate emergency through policies in the new local plan. Um, it's clearly a very big area of, of work and of, of massive importance. Um, so what we've tried to do is keep this report quite succinct and, and, and to the point to just um, highlight some of the key approaches and, and policy responses we could make. Um, I think there's obviously a lot of knowledge out there and a lot of discussion about potential uh, responses to climate change emergency already. So we've sought not to, to duplicate a lot of that and to focus very much on, on the planning sort of nuts and bolts of responses as it were. Um, so, uh, and obviously the local plan has a key role to play in, in, in addressing that. Um, so it's just starting off in terms of the responses into the issues and options consultation, I think this was one area where there was a clear consensus um, around the options that we presented. So 80% of respondents supported um, a requirement for new development to be net zero through the new local plan and 60% and of respondents were in favour of identifying suitable areas for renewable energy de development. So there's a clearly two key areas of, uh, of majority uh, of views uh, uh, in response to those and so we're certainly looking to incorporate those into the new local plan. Um, it's important also to note the uh, low carbon study that was undertaken uh, as part of work on, on, the, on the GASP um, as I say, has, isn't, clearly isn't being pursued, but the evidence is still important in terms of helping to underpin this new local plan. And the low carbon study is, is an excellent piece of work that helps to direct us in terms of the key policy responses we can make through planning policy. And it established a, a, a hierarchy, uh, energy hierarchy in terms of how we can respond to creating low carbon solutions and it's important to note in terms of planning the number one priority through that hierarchy was considered to be locating development in sustainable locations as the number one response we can make through planning policy. Uh, and number two was fabric measures uh, like improved insulation and building standards to make uh, developments more, more sustainable and more efficient. Uh, and the third was about employing um, renewable technologies uh, and, and offsetting. Uh, so, so clearly these have major bearings on policies in terms of the new local plan, both in terms of where we allocate development to ensure that it's located in sustainable locations, but also in terms of policies around uh, performance measures in new homes uh, and, and new developments more broadly. Um, and ensuring that those are, are, are developed. So we're looking at that in relation to the future home standard that I think has been mentioned before in terms of what government's looking to introduce, um, get conflicting stories about when announcements might be made on that, but uh, there's been some suggestions that the relevant changes to building regulations may come forward quite soon. Uh, so that will help to give us some clarity. But um, in any event, what we're looking to promote through the local plan is net zero development from adoption of the plan and then putting measures in place to ensure that those standards are actually delivered in terms of the real world um, monitoring of that to ensure compliance with those standards. Um, Beyond that, um, we're also looking at policies to identify areas where solar and wind energy opportunities exist in the district, um, so that these can be identified in the plan. The low carbon study identifies quite a large areas where solar energy opportunities exist within the district. Uh, there are, however, relatively few opportunities in terms of wind energy, um, but equally those uh, we feel should be identified in the plan as well. 
Um, we're also looking to maximise opportunities um, for recycling waste heat and using district heating systems in terms of large scale development allocations. Uh, our members will be aware of that and how those opportunities could potentially link into the existing district heat system as well. Um, we also think it's important to highlight embodied carbon. Uh, I think this is something that gets um, gets forgotten really but how much carbon is already embedded in the buildings that already exist uh, and, and the fact that uh, building new buildings uh, embeds a lot of carbon just in the groundwork uh, and constructing foundations of, of new buildings um, regardless of the performance standards they're built to um, so trying to recycle make use of existing buildings or where that's not possible make use of, uh, of foundations where possible uh, I think is an important component to our planning response uh, to this as well, as well as things like adaptations. Um, so uh, construction of green walls, incorporating street trees into developments, sustainable drainage systems, planting of new woodlands um, are also important components of that strategy. So hopefully this report provides you with sort of some headlines and the key issues that we're looking to address in the plan. Welcome members' comments on that and, and further suggestions that we should be incorporating into our thinking uh, as we develop the, the working draft of the local plan for presentation at your next meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Ed. Um, so we'll start outside of committee first, and it's over to the portfolio holder for climate emergency, Marianne Richter. Thank you, Chair. I'll just make a few brief comments. Um, I note that uh, the recommendation is that we should really note the proposed approaches, but I really feel that we ought to have a policy as soon as possible requiring all developers to build properties to a high level of energy efficiency. It's obviously very expensive to retrofit, which is an avoidable expense. So the more we can do now to require delivery of en energy efficient buildings, the better. Also, could access to good public transport and trails for walking and cycling be mandatory in any future development? Similarly, with biodiversity and tree planting, could we make this a requirement in new schemes too, so that wildlife corridors are provided for wildlife? We have one of the lowest levels of tree cover in Europe and 97% of wildflower meadows have been lost. I repeat that, 97% have been lost. I'm very pleased to see item 7.2 about embodied carbon seeking to discourage demolition of perfectly sound buildings. I hope this will be adopted because of the high level of emissions associated with traditional building methods. Finally, avoiding development on flood zones is crucial no more than ever, bearing in mind the impact of climate change and the increasing risk of flooding, as highlighted earlier by Councillor Young. Too late for Sid Ford, though. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Rickson. Uh, and with that, we're going straight to Councillor Young. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's a great report. Um, a lot of a lot of it I support. Um, just a couple of points. Uh, battery storage um, you talk about, um, and we tend to think of rare metal uh, ba battery storage when we say uh, 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 batteries, but um, you can um, store energy in other forms other than a acid type battery. Um, uh, and, and a lot more environmentally friendly uh, techniques such as storing electricity with uh, water holdings. Um, uh, I don't think we've got the, uh, the geography for uh, uh, lakes to be uh, filled up and released during the night or stuff like that, but um, some countries do it. Um, there are um, techniques now of compressing the air and releasing it slowly. Um, which will um, uh, store uh, the energy. So we need to be looking at um, uh, other forms of uh, storage of um, electricity. Uh, vehicle power, uh, we tend to be looking at uh, electric uh, for uh, going from uh, fossil fuels uh, for, uh, for car use, but for uh, anything larger than a car, um, or a large fan anyway, uh, uh, batteries are uh, not 
possibly the, the best answer. Uh, um, and heavy goods vehicles and heavy plant, um, hydrogen uh, 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 combustion engines might be the way forward. Um, there has been some uh, fantastic work done in the last couple of years by a couple of companies. Um, and we shouldn't be losing sight that um, of these other energies coming forward. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Young. So no other members from outside of committee will move inside. Councillor Bailey, you're up first. Thank you very much. Um, I am really quite concerned um, about um, the zoning, the zoning of solar and the zoning of wind. Um, I am concerned because typically solar farms are, are large. And so if we're talking about zoning areas for solar farms, which will basically be approved except in exceptional circumstances, that really removes it, it, it goes against the democratic process um, whereby individuals can make representations. And I'm concerned that we're going to end up with swathes of solar panels across our countryside. And I think people will rightly question why are we doing that when there are so many industrial buildings and houses that don't have solar panels and of course i'm very much in support of renewable energy but what i'm not in support of is destroying the countryside because it makes it easier for solar developers and i think considering how important this is for our landscape how important it is for ecology we need far more information it, it, I don't really understand. We've had loads and loads of uh, papers that have come forward, but my recollection is that we haven't had a paper. This is just part of another paper. And I think considering, I think we need to take a proportionate approach, um, considering the impact this is likely to have on the countryside, we need to understand far more about it. We need to understand, for instance, when we're dealing with housing development, we have the HELA process. So who's considering the, 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 the large areas that are going to be zoned? Who's doing that? Where's the democratic process? Zoning is something that um, was very much in the government's um, planning proposals and has been largely discredited, well, not discredited, but not supported. There's been uproar about it. And of course, I want to see more renewables, but I'm really, really concerned that th what this means in this policy um, is that actually whole areas are going to be subsumed in solar arrays. And I think that people will be very upset. And I think we need more clarity on how we protect the landscape, how we give people um, a, a, a voice in that process and I think that um, we need to understand much more about it and I don't re really follow how we've got to a situation where in the meeting before we're due to see the local plan we haven't this is the only information that we've received and you know the report on uh, low carbon is fine but it's a very very long and detailed report which makes it quite difficult to follow what actually is intended. So um, my request is to have some clear explanation from Mr. Freeman about how this is going to work. And I, I think I, I can't support a process which sets aside vast areas for solar arrays when there's so many, un so many buildings um, commercial and residential that don't have solar um, panels. So um, uh, that's, I'm concerned about that. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Bailey. I'll, I'll, I'll take that straight to, to Mr. Freeman, but isn't it to do with the fact of where the electrical substations are to actually hook these solar stations up to? Uh, and that's what you're referring to in the report, Ed? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so the zones are, are really about where it's possible, fundamentally, um, because of connectivities to, to the grid, in, in the case of solar in particular. 
um, combined with with um, uh, you know hours of natural sunlight, um, and in terms of the wind, in terms of where the wind levels are, are high enough to make it a, a efficient to have wind turbines within those. So the, the idea is that the plan will have those zones identified on on a map, and then we'll have a criteria based policy uh, that seeks to control uh, the circumstances in which those developments would be appropriate in those zones, and that would take account of things like the landscape impact. Um, and, and what happens to the land beneath the solar panels, et cetera. We will also have, have policies seeking to, to encourage the use of solar panels on the rooftops of, of buildings as, as well. Um, so both of those areas we're, we're intending to cover in, in the draft policies. Um, apologies if, if members feel there wasn't sufficient information on those, those, uh, that particular issue in, in this report. Um, we will have those details included in the working draft of the local plan for your December meeting there. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Chairman, uh, could I make a proposal? Yes, of course, Councillor, and you can make a proposal. Yes. What I'd like to do is um, please propose to eliminate uh, paragraph 5.5 and start what is then going to be 5.6, which will become 5.5, to read... Uh, as it is without the words in addition. I think that if we designate too much of our countryside at this point in time without restriction, then we are going to get a massive uh, set of proposals for solar panels and solar panels whether we like it or not, sour the ground underneath and make it very difficult to restore to agricultural use. So all I'm suggesting is that 5.6, as it will read, a policy of general support for renewable technology, including community energy schemes in our other parts of the district will be supported subject to an assessment of impacts. We could also learn out the word other and read it all parts of the district. So what I'm proposing is we retain that fundamental democratic control for the uh, planning committee and do not preclude and prejudge the uh, allocation of solar panels. Thank you, Chair. That's the proposal. Councillor Allen, just, just so that it's, it covers everything, in, are you happy to accept the report otherwise? I'm, a, I'm very happy to accept uh, the report uh, subject to some consideration uh, with you about where we build the design of homes into uh, policies. But uh, otherwise, I'm very happy to propose the whole thing without paragraph 5.5 and with 5.6 altered as proposed. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Allen. So could, uh, does anyone wish to second that proposal? I think I probably do, but could you just read it out once more, please? Councillor Allen. Perhaps Shirley could read it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, therefore, the recommendation in the report is that Strategic Planning Committee note the proposed approaches to tackling the climate change emergency through the local plan as set out in the report, with the deletion of paragraph 5.5 and the wording in addition within paragraph 5.6. Thanks very much. So, Councillor Bailey, do you wish to second that? Uh, I think I probably do. So we're expressing general support without specifically zoning. Is that correct? It seems that way, yes. Yeah, in that case, I'll, I'll happily second that. Thank you very much. So Councillor Davey, it's over to you now. Thank you, Chair. I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, so uh, I'll just say now, um, I think that 5.5 uh, five could be modified um, I agree that we shouldn't zone so that there's so that we kind of cede control um, over planning permission. Um, but I think 
identifying suitable areas um, for development of wind and solar um, would would be a prudent move anyway. Um, so uh, perhaps I'd prefer just um, uh, removing perhaps the um, line in these areas, permission will only be refused in exceptional circumstances. I, I will also say 5.6 doesn't totally make sense uh, if you delete 5.5 five because you've got um, in other parts of the district um, and uh, that the implication of that is that it, the other parts of the district are where it's not already been identified for, for solar. Anyway, um, I, firstly, I, I welcome the support for uh, zero carbon uh, development that was shown through the consultation. I'm very pleased there was so much support for that. Um, I, like Councillor Bailey, I have to say I do, I, I despair rather that we have got huge areas of land being taken up by solar farms uh, around East Devon. Um, when there are so many roofs that were that are suitable um, for solar panels that haven't got them, um, in the road I'm in now, uh, I have solar panels on my roof. It's a south-facing roof. It's absolutely ideal for solar panels. Um, my house is the only one in this road that has panels on it, um, and uh, they're a rarity really and we should have a massive program um, of getting solar panels onto roofs um, before we start covering the countryside in panels and apparently these things are extremely lucrative um, because I was speaking to a, a friend the other day who has a fair amount of land and he was offered eye-watering amounts for his land for solar development um, so there is clearly money in this in spite of the uh, much lower um, rate of feed-in tariff now so I, I'm not totally against solar uh, farms in the countryside because we have got to get our energy from somewhere and I'd much rather see that than a coal-fired power station or any other fossil fuel using power station or for that matter a nuclear power station um, so uh, I think they are much lower impact I can't um, argue with what Councillor Allen has said about them souring the ground it's not something I've ever heard before um, and I know in some cases it has been proposed to uh, seed wildflower meadows uh, around solar panels um, so um, I'm, I'm rather surprised by that. I would also like to see far more support for community uh, solar schemes because I think often one of the reasons there's so much resistance to these uh, large solar developments is that the local community gains nothing from them. Um, but if they were offered lower cost electricity as a result, I think they, they'd be much more in favour so um, I think I would like to see strong support uh, for community solar schemes um, that, that would benefit local people rather than uh, commercial developers. Um, moving on to a couple of other things, um, district heating networks. Um, I'm very uncomfortable about these. I feel if houses were built to a high enough standard we wouldn't need district heating networks um, most homes if they were built to a high enough standard would need minimal heating and that could probably be provided by a, by a small electrical unit um, without requiring these these large um, engineering uh, works in order to provide every home uh, with a heat supply um, so I'm, I'm uncomfortable about those and I've always been sceptical. Um, uh, as similarly, heat from waste uh, sounds like a great idea um, until you consider that we shouldn't be producing so much waste. That is the problem with the linear economy that we have rather than the circular economy. And I recommend David Attenborough on the subject of the, uh, the linear versus the... Re the, the, the um, the cyclical economy. Um, so um, 
Well, on those two things, I'm 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 sceptical, and I I will remain so. I think um, I totally welcome the avoidance of demolition. Um, I have a co-op near me that was built on the site of a, a previous garage. Um, and when they built the co-op, rather than raise the whole thing to the ground um, and rebuild, they actually used part of the existing building. There were no new foundations went in, I don't think. Um, and they used, I think, um, two at least two walls of the previous building um, in order to, to build on to. And that's not something you see very often. Um, and I, I think the more of that we see, uh, the better, rather than the the favoured approach of many developers which is simply to demolish and rebuild. Um, uh, I would like to see any developments that take place um, being required to produce a travel plan showing how the residents of that village uh, of, of that development will be able to travel sustainably um, and any new roads and developments I would like those to have provision for walking and cycling I think that should be a requirement in the local plan um, that they show how the people who are going to live there are going to be able to travel sustainably um, and finally on the question of sustainable transport I, I think while I I welcome the, the growth in electric cars and the provision that we're making for people to charge those. I think we've got to get away from the idea that we can simply replace the 36 million cars in this country, is it, um, with electric cars. I, it's an unsustainable model um, and we have got to change it. We need better public transport. We need more cycling. We need more walking. The argument I am most frequently against cycling is, well, you can't cycle. The roads are too dangerous. We've just heard Councillor Howe saying that Exeter will need to consider its permeability to road traffic. Well, actually, no. What we need to do is not build more roads. We need to get fewer cars having to use the roads. And they do that because there's good public transport, because there are good active um, travel links and um, that, that you just don't need that volume of traffic that people's lifestyles are such that they don't need to hop in a car every five minutes in order to go about their daily business. So we've got to rethink the whole way that we look at transport and not simply say right well we'll all just swap our cars for electric cars and that'll be it problem solved. Um, we need a much more holistic approach to transport. Um, and uh, I think I've finished my rant now, uh, so uh, I shall stop there. Thanks very much, Councillor David. Really some great points there. Councillor Howe, over to you. Thank you. I was going to try and avoid speaking on this one because I didn't want a clean sheet, but nevertheless, um, I actually want to agree with most of what's been said. I think we need to pick up uh, Councillor Rickson, who started this by saying we need to do this faster. I think we need to point out we can't do it any faster because currently energy efficiency of homes is set by building control and building standards, uh, not part of the planning process. Um, and there needs a legislative change, is my understanding, Mr. Freeman, to, to allow us to do this. This is hopefully the future. Hopefully we're allowed to do this and can do that. Um, with regards to solar panels, I'm between the devil and the deep blue sea. I... I I don't know. I, I, solar panels I keep looking at and everything else, uh, like Councillor Allen has said, pretty well dead. There's no real wildlife around them. People do originally put flowers because they said they would like to flower, uh, to uh, so meadow flowers and everything else. And you go back a couple of years later and all you see is scraggly grass, relatively cut short because the they like to maintain it so they don't interfere with the solar panel efficiency or anything else. So I'm sceptical of solar panels apart from on roofs where I think we should be challenging them to make sure they're there but then comes the part this report doesn't really identify um, and that is to put solar panels on roofs ideally those roofs need to be south facing so there is no encouragement here to make developers 
turn their roofs the correct way so that when solar panels get put on them, whether it's part of the development or later on as an owner chooses to add it to their building, it's facing the best possible way it can to utilize that energy. Um, so that's solar panels. Picking up Councillor Davies' point on highways, I didn't mention the car when I spoke about Exeter. I just spoke about congestion and everything else. And to be honest, if Exeter wants to put a tramway running from somewhere to somewhere that was fast, frequent and efficient, I think most car owners will quite possibly stop using their cars. But being as the buses are stuck in the same blooming traffic that the cars that you're trying to get rid of are, and go nowhere and are terrible and etc. then that ain't happening. So there needs to be a wholesale change in Exeter City's attitude. That's different again. Um, <sighs> renewable energy. Ignoring solar panels, it's good that renewable energy doesn't talk about anaerobic digesters. And I'm just wondering whether we should. Um, because for farms, on-farm, small-scale anaerobic digesters might well work but we should not be supporting commercial anaerobic digesters that are not green, they're not efficient, they're non-nuisance, in fact, they cause immense nuisances to everyone, and we should be limiting them or just plain saying no. So I'm wondering whether we should put that in here somewhere as well. Um, but all in all, I like this report, you know, and I hope we are allowed to do what's in here. So. Um, I'm struggling to support the motion as it's put because I think there needs to be a couple of other changes, um, but I'm thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Howe. Councillor Arnold, we move to you next. Thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> May I be uh, pompous enough to remind everybody, including Ed, uh, you are Chair, Chair. You are not Chairman, Chair. Um, uh, again. Um, right. So uh, I have a little, uh, just one small difficulty with this. And I don't know, I wonder if you can help me out, Chair, on this. Um, you know, just everything everybody said is excellent and agree. Um, one of the key priorities of this council, one of the three stated priorities uh, through uh, our own council plan, is this it is the environment. It's now about a year and a half since um, I appointed, in fact, we created a new role of portfolio holder for climate action and, and now emergency response. Um, we have appointed a, which I'm delighted, there is an officer doing that as well. Um, the report says, which portfolios does this come under? Strategic planning, that's quite right but it also comes under climate action and emergency response. This report and discussions pertaining to it, and I, and I intend no criticism of you, Chair, or of Mr. Freeman this at all, has not been properly discussed yet with the climate action and emergency response portfolio holder. Now, I understand, I really understand truly um, the work pressures on officers, I get that, I get that we're trying to do this local plan as fast as possible, but this is central to what we are trying to do. Um, and I do think that an awful lot of the comments that have been made today would have been captured if there had been more meetings around this subject involving uh, the other portfolio holder for climate action, Councillor Rickson, who's basically had the benefit of about the two minute as ever very constructive, very courteous report today, a contribution today. So, Chair, I'll put it here. I don't know quite what to do. Um, if it wasn't for the fact that next meeting we're getting a draft local plan being put to us, what I would be proposing now, I, I would put it as, as I would propose it, was that we would defer this item until the December meeting. But I don't know quite how that works. But I, I have to say, I, I don't think... There's a lot that's been drawn from the work on GESP, which is great, and that was exactly our intention, was not to throw away that work. And there has been other stuff that's come out of uh, uh, stuff in the public domain, you know, developing you know, government policy from government and so forth. So that's all excellent. But to me, it's not the complete piece of work at the moment. So I don't know what to do, Chair. We could note this, I suppose, because you know, we can't go on with this meeting all day. Um, but I'm trying to find a mechanism by which actually 
both you, Chair, and the Portfolio Holder for Climate Action can have another little look at this and then bring it back to this committee. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnold. Just to say that any discussions from today will be getting brought back through the, and it will be a very early stage draft. It's not going to be complete at all. Um, and it will be getting brought back next month. So any any anything put forward today will be taken into consideration and can be then brought back. Um, Ed, do you have anything you wish to add? Uh, and any comments from uh, other officer engagements? Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I take the comments on on board. Um, as as you say, Chair, there there is time to do lots of further engagement on these issues I think as we develop the policies um, from the working draft forwards um, uh, time constraints make it difficult but yes um, we perhaps need to do better to engage with the, the, the wider portfolio holders within the cabinet on these sorts of issues um, I did want to make a comment while I'm speaking if I may on the motion that's been put forward by Councillor Allen which if I understand correctly the intent of which would basically effectively mean members saying that they would not want us to identify suitable areas for solar and wind energy uh, in, in the policies in the in the new local plan. Um, if I've understood correctly and that's the intent, then I kind of feel I ought to draw members' attention to the guidance in the NPPF on this issue, which is not wonderfully clear, it has to be said, but um, it does require us to... Um, in terms of solar energy to at least consider um, mapping out opportunities for, for solar energy opportunities within the district. And then later wording goes on to presume that we have them in terms of how we administer them in terms of planning applications. So I think in terms of solar, there is a presumption in the NPPF that we do do this process and have maps of solar energy opportunities. And then it's a bit more definitive in terms of wind because um, in a footnote, it does say uh, a proposed wind energy development involving one or, one or more turbines should not be considered acceptable unless it is in an area identified as suitable for wind energy development in the development plan. So um, by virtue of that footnote, it suggests that we do have to have a map of opportunities for wind energy. So I, I would just highlight those issues in terms of uh, the motion that's been put forward in that we might not actually have a great deal of choice in mapping those areas. Uh, I'll have to do some further digging than what I've done on the hoof. Um, but um, it looks like it may actually be a requirement of the NPPF that we have those areas mapped. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just for members' awareness, it will be most likely around those two areas of the substations. So it would be around the areas of Bork Church and Broadcast. In terms of solar, yes, those are the two big areas where we, we currently get applications and, and where it is most viable in terms of connecting into the grid. So those are the main areas. Um, I would also say, thinking about it, that is one thing to obviously map those areas. The wording of the policy is obviously up, up to us. So it, it may be that the, the, uh, the, the members putting forward and seconding the motion were mainly concerned about the wording that they would only be refused in exceptional circumstances. We can obviously look again at, at the wording to ensure that the um, criteria based policy is, is suitably worded. Uh, even within those mapped areas to, to address concerns about landscape impact and the impact on the land beneath the panels. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, Councillor Rylands, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, 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 I do really agree with what Councillor Howe said about um, industrial-sized anaerobic digesters. I think they, they bring quite a lot of environmental negative effects, and I really do think that's a point worth considering. And I also agreed with what Councillor Davy said about... Um, large-scale solar arrays being imposed on local communities in often hundreds and hundreds of acres with pretty much very little involvement from the local community. Um, so those are the two points that I would definitely pick up from, from other people. Regarding the entire document, well, it's quite a comfortable document, isn't it? it it's, it's almost like it's restating what we're already doing, and that's my slight beef with it. It doesn't feel very ambitious. Because, I mean, this is designed to be incorporated into a plan that's going to see us through some quite turbulent years and probably for at least a decade, you know, maybe seven years before we can revise it. And it just doesn't feel ambitious enough. And so, like, 
So, yes, OK, so we're already installing district heating. Are we are we going to lay down in our local plan that district heating installations that are installed, if we are going to go that way, can be easily switched to genuinely renewable sources of heat? Because like Councillor Davy, I don't agree that burning um, plastics from commercial waste is, is, a, is a renewable source of heat. And hopefully in time, with our with recycling efforts redoubling, that en that energy, which is basically hydrocarbons as well, it's oil, will disappear. So there won't be any of that left to burn. So then what do we do with these plants? So that's my one question. Um, regarding the adapting to climate change. OK, obviously, I really like woodland, love new trees. One of the best sources of carbon capture is peat bogland and kelp forests. Now, we're surrounded by sea. So what are we doing to encourage kelp forests around our coastline, which are an incredibly good source of CO2 capture and crucially not destroying them with, um, in, in, uh, um, with random releases of sewage into the sea? Um, so, you know, can we put those into the local plan? Can we encourage the, 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 the proliferation of kelp around our coastline? You know, I, I, I just feel like we could go a lot further with this and actually incorporate, you know, modern thinking on, on carbon capture and on, um, re, you know, renewable technologies and reducing um, the impacts of our actions. Um, and of course, we should be building houses that barely need any heating. That should go without saying by now. It really should. So how can we incorporate? And I, understand, I hear what you were saying Ed, about the national, the national um, planning framework guidelines. Surely we need to be pushing for those to be to be upped. We can't keep building houses out of matchsticks and tiki tacky and hope that you know somehow they'll be still okay in thirty years because they won't be. They'll just all that material will just be wasted. We need to be building solid houses that don't need very much heating, that are properly insulated and don't get damp. And it's crucially, we need to be considering where we put them. I mean, I was amazed to read that we, we should be avoiding development on flood zones. Do we not already? Surely we do. We don't already build in flood zones. So why is that even in this document as a plan? It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't even be here. It should be go without saying that we don't build in flood zones. We should be building in, not building in projected flood zones for in 30 years time. So we need to work out where things are going to get a bit damp in, within the next 30 or 40 years and not build there. Um, so can we just go further? Because it just feels like it's just a restatement of what we're basically doing already in this document. Please can we be more bold? That's my question. And, you know, my... Thanks very much, Councillor Rylance. Um, we, I'll, I'll take Councillor Hayward and then we'll go to Ed again. Councillor Hayward, over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, coming back to what Councillor Rylance has just said, uh, Axminster suffered uh, some extraordinary flooding. Uh, and at the Town Council meeting last night, members of the public who've lived here for 40 years have said they cannot understand why the town is flooding in different ways. The, did, the water did not go where it has always gone. And that has caused huge problems for residents because a lot of them, people, they take resilience measures, they get sandbags. But people who've never flooded tend to, you know, we're all a bit, you know, blasé. We think, oh, it's going to happen down the road. But this time it didn't. People who have never been flooded were flooded with very little warning. That's a discussion we can take forward. Um, a lot of development has happened in Axminster. I, mean, I know this is not all about Axminster. On floodplains, Axminster is a floodplain. And yet we repeatedly build on it. And then we wonder why houses get flooded. Councillor Rylance touched on them. The, um, the, the rather poor quality of modern building and that, you know, they, they won't survive, you know, hundreds of years, perhaps, as other houses have. Um, I was fortunate to be at um, Extra Race Course a few years ago at a CPRE event where the then minister involved, Kit Malthouse, um, said with no hint of irony on his face that modern houses will be the, the listed buildings of the future. And after the laughter had died down in the room, which took about 20 minutes, um, everyone said, you're just joking. Modern, modern builders don't need their houses to last. In fact, it's like a well-known electrical IT wholesaler, retailer, manufacturer. They want those buildings to fall down because then they can sell you another one. There's no intention for these to be the houses of the future. But sorry, um, I just wanted to come in. And, uh, sorry, I had to just respond to those points. Um, 
One on the issue that Hawke Church has been mentioned. As you know, Hawke Church is in Yarty Ward and Hawke Church has, for no other word, been blighted, absolutely blighted by um, solar panel arrays and farms. It has the misfortune not to be in the AUMB. It's sandwiched between three AUMBs and it happens to have a great electrical substation connection slap bang in the middle of it. And because of that, it's been ruthlessly exploited. Almost every square available inch of green field has been covered in solar panels. And the residents now accept it. What are they going to do? Because this council's planning committee, because of planning law, and, it, and it's not aimed, I was on the planning committee when we considered more of them, has no option but to say yes. And Hawk Church has been blighted. A beautiful piece of East Devon countryside has been covered in shiny black panels. But to come back to something that um, uh, Councillor Davy said about communities not getting any benefit, I just do have to chip in and respond on that point. Invariably, that's correct, because the people who build them aren't obliged to give any community benefit. However, some providers, and it is some, do provide community benefit. They make payments to the local councils into eco funds, into green funds, um, Port Church Parish Council has one, Acton the Town Council has a fund. And whilst some consider that blood money, others consider it, I won't use the word, another word. Um, the fact is that money has been made available and is being used by those communities to mitigate, to some small degree, the effects of those solar panel arrays. So uh, Councillor Davy wasn't wrong, and, and, and ordinarily I would entirely agree, but I think it's only fair for the sake of probity and for the minutes and us listening, that occasionally communities do get some benefit back from these. Um, whether they are commensurate with the damage caused to the environment, that's for some a, a, um, a subjective point. But thank you very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Hayward. And I'll, I'll come back to you now. Can we be more imaginative? Can we be more creative and can we be more ambitious with the plans that we've got in front of us? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I mean, I, I think it does go beyond quite significantly what we do at, at the moment. Um, we are slightly hamstrung by the fact that whatever local plan we put forward has to comply with the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, and frankly, the National Planning Policy Framework is not very ambitious at the moment when it comes to climate change, um, arguably, uh, even promoting uh, zero carbon development, uh, net zero carbon development from adoption of the plan is technically not in accordance with the MPPF. We're assuming that we can, that the guidance will get to that point um, in, in time because that's such a key factor in, in all of this key measure. Um, so uh, I'm open to suggestions of other things we can do and, and we can look at what would comply with, with the MPPF. Um, but that, that is a, a, a constraint, I suppose, as things stand at the moment. The other thing I would say is that obviously we need to bear in mind that there are lots of different actions we could take in terms of responding to climate change, but not all of them are planning matters. Um, so, for example, you, you don't need planning permission to plant a forest. Um, so uh, other than having policies that perhaps encourage that and encourage street trees and new developments and things, it's not, not for planning to do that. So I think uh, Councillor Rylance made mention of, of kelp forests, which is another good means of, of doing that. But a, a, again, it wouldn't be a planning issue to deal with that. In fact, I think I'm right in saying the local plan, can our, our administrative area only covers up to the low water mark. Beyond that, it's the marine management organisation who would have to take that forward. Um, so there are limitations on, on what we can do. Uh, as has been mentioned, um, the government have consulted in terms of building standards of, of that to becoming entirely within building regulations in terms of uh, zero carbon standard levels of insulation things. So if that comes to fruition, then that would deal with that, that issue and, and, and take it outside of the planning domain, unless we can have uh, elevated standards through, through planning, in which case there might still be a need for a policy. There's still lots of uncertainty, as you can tell, about uh, lots of these issues. Um, so um, we can look at other things. 
I, I would say uh, also another point was made about flood zones and building in flood zones. Uh, you, you're correct, we don't build in flood zones, but we still need to have a policy moving forward, maintain the policy that we have in the new local plan to ensure that we can resist development in flood zones in the future. Um, so it's not necessarily all new measures, we still need to maintain the measures we already have um, in the new plan. Um, finally, the other point I picked up on was about district heating systems. I mean, the, the reason why I think we're promoting district heating systems and think it's is a good solution is, is because, yes, they need to get on to um, a renewable form of heat. But once you have the infrastructure there and the pipe work in connecting the properties, there are so many opportunities to connect them up to all sorts of renewable heat sources. Um, the, the energy from waste plant has, has been cited as, as one option, and maybe that's an option in the short term, while, while we are in a position of unfortunately generating all of this waste that needs to be burnt. But once you've got the pipe work in, it can be connected to all sorts of waste heat opportunities um, and, and create a very renewable um, energy efficient uh, heating system for those homes. Um, so I do think there's benefit in, in pursuing that system. I appreciate it's something that's not new to us. We were trailblazing, I think, with Cranbrook in having a district heating system there. It's still relatively new technology. Um, so I think it's just that we were ahead of the game there. Um, hopefully that responds to all the points, um, but happy to come back if I've missed anything. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Shed. Um... Okay, well, I'll uh, Councillor Faithful, uh, we'll come back out of committee and come over to you. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. Um, all this talk about solar farms is something I've been wanting to speak to somebody about anyway. Uh, whether we should have um, like a limit, what, where they want to connect into is these sub, I think they're sub sub stations, but. Um, the solar farms should be the size for that community that substation is supplying to with a possible limited surplus. That way we sort of, we're providing the electricity they need for that area, but you're not blasting the whole place with solar farms all over the place. Cause I'm sure that what's being built is way beyond what that local community actually need. Anyway, that's what, oh, possibly want that for next meeting the the local plan one but there you go thank you chair thanks very much for that peter councillor blakey we'll come to you next thank you chair um a couple of small points um first of all with regard to solar arrays i, I really do believe that we should um <clears throat> we should be using these but in such a way that we don't actually find ourselves using good grade agricultural land to do it on. I think if, if there is a policy that we can put in place that says that uh, we will only do it on low grade land so that we do preserve at least the best of our agricultural land for that purpose. Um, and also where these uh, arrays are put in place that actually something could be better done uh, with regard to the landscaping of, uh, of those those enormous fields essentially is what they are. Um, but that said, um, they are a useful way of generating electricity for, um, the, the, for, the, for us and for the rest of the country, which is, uh, apart from anything else, silent, which in itself is very useful. Um, and uh, Mr. Freeman's already touched on um, district heating. And if I go back to what Councillor Davy had to say about it, um, district heating is not just about keeping a house warm. Um, and it's certainly true that um, houses need to be built in such a way that their insulation properties are very good. Um, as I sit here, I sit in a house that, um, that has been built to modern insulation standards and does have uh, district heating. Uh, but of course, it, 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 the house stays pretty warm. Um, not a problem with that, but it's also important that the district heating supplies hot water. Um, uh, so for uh, bathing, washing and so on, um, that's important too. And the fact is that um, although the costs to the consumer are probably not very much different to um, that that you would pay for a gas boiler or, uh, or other forms of heating at the moment, 
the carbon emissions from the heat generating unit are significantly below. Now, I haven't got the figure, but I've got a, I've got a feeling it's something like 40% below that, which would be the case if, um, uh, if we had individual heat units, boilers or whatever, um, in, in individual houses. So I think that the district heating is something that we should be pursuing for the future. And as, um, as Mr. Freeman points out, there will be other potential fuel sources for the future. I'd like to think that at uh, some point, probably not in my lifetime, uh, that we'll find a uh, way of uh, producing commercial quantities of hydrogen, um, at which point we have a completely clean solution. So uh, I do believe that we should be pursuing that, but with one final caveat, which is um, uh, something that I think may be coming, but that the um, uh, district heat um, business should be regulated in the same way that the electricity and gas business, business currently is. At the moment, it's um, it's unregulated, so the the, um, the the heat companies take Eon as a for example, not naming and shaming. They happen to be our local one. Um, there are not limits on the pricing that they can apply to the uh, to the heat units, and I think that that's something that will need to be brought in as district heat networks develop across the country. It's gonna be a big thing and it needs, it needs to be brought under some kind of regulation and under control. Um, and as for the, um, the availability of waste, um, in a perfect world, there wouldn't be any, of course, Councillor David is quite right in that, but we live in an imperfect world and I think there will always be waste that will be there to act as a fuel for, um, for district heating and other, other purposes. There we are, that's all, thanks. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Blakey. Councillor Howe, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, there's nothing in this report that talks about food. And let's face it, part of the climate emergency also involves us being able to feed ourselves. So I'm throwing that out there because I haven't got a solution to that one. Um, we currently have a recommendation to approve subject to 5.5 being taken out and 5.6 being slightly amended. But Mr. Freeman then said there was inconsistencies further on. So I don't know where we are with that. But nowhere in this report is anything about community microgeneration using water, i.e. our rivers, which can be done in a silent way, is consistent. In fact, doesn't need the sun to be up or the wind to be blowing because it generates all the time. So we need to look at that. And in fact, it doesn't harm the wildlife because you can always bypass it for the uh, fish and everything else. So I would like to see our rivers used. And in fact, you can use them several times over going downstream. So I would like to see a something about that. Coming back to solar panels, if we got a recommendation to go forward one way or another through this, I would like to see the wording on solar panels on greenfield sites. I guess Mr. Freeman understands what I'm saying there to also include the phrase net biodiversity or oh, biodiversity net gains on solar installations. Because I'm sick to death of them saying, oh, we'll plant flowers, we'll do this and everything else. No, they need to show it, they need to do it, and they need to make sure the wildlife is enhanced, not made worse. Um, I would also like to see and recommend the other amendment of anaerobic digesters to be limited to a size. And I'm happy for Mr. Freeman to specify that size. He knows the problems we've had with anaerobic digesters. He also knows where there seems to be a reasonable on-farm size and where everything else is definitely not on-farm. It is commercial, exploitative, um, harassment to people around it and everything else. So. Subject to the proposal in second, I would like those considerations put into this. I haven't got the perfect words. I never have the perfect words for this, but I hope someone can either come up with a solution or let Mr. Freeman word those things to go forward. Um, good luck. Sorry. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Howe. Councillor Allen, I'll come to you first. Um, obviously, Councillor Howe's made a number of amendments there. Are you, generally, are you happy with what he's put forward? What, what I have... Uh... Uh, tried to do uh, is <clears throat> I've tried to take all of that into account and emailed uh, uh, Jess Bailey and Mike Howe and yourself and uh, Shirley with a proposed set of words 
which incorporates all of that, while taking into account what Councillor Arnott was saying about this being a core policy in the new corporate plan. Uh, I don't know if Shirley's actually ma managed to pick that up or Mike has. I don't know whether you have, uh, Councillor Ledger. I, I will attempt, therefore, to read them out uh, and, and see whether everybody's happy. Uh, point, leaving 5.5 as it is, it's proposed that in order to maximise opportunities for delivering renewables and provide certainty to the industry, suitable areas for solar and wind energies are mapped out. This approach is also strongly supported in the Issues and Options Consultation, and it would equate to a significant uplift in support for renewables which matches the council's ambition to tackle the climate emergency. In other words, I've taken out the issue of um, restricting our ability to refuse. Uh, 5.6 then reads exactly the same as it did before. And 5.7 brings in, however, Industrial scale anaerobic digesters are not considered suitable developments. Now, of course, Ed can adapt that accordingly. So I hope that I've included most of what Mike said, and at least we can get um, paragraph five, five, six, and seven sorted by a vote. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Anna. Councillor Howe, do you think that's pretty much covered most of what you put forward? He, he's covered very well. Thank you, Councillor Allen, for that. I have been reading it. The only thing I would ask is in 5.5 .5, that we add any proposal should show its net, its biodiversity net gains as part of it. Councillor Allen, are you happy with that? I'm happy if Jess Bailey is because she seconded it. Councillor Bailey, as the seconder, are you happy with the proposed amendments? Uh, well, my, my general feel is that um, we kind of, I feel like I haven't got enough information. So I feel a bit like Councillor Arnott said earlier, that we're kind of slightly ma making up on the hoof slightly without being absolutely clear. And I'm, I'm just a bit concerned about... Um, you know, Ed was advising about what the requirements are for the MPPF. And uh, so I'm just slightly uneasy. And if there was, what I'd really like is a further <laughs> report on it. And I know that the deadline, I know that the next meeting is the 14th of December when the local plan draft is coming forward. Um, but I feel that this is such an important issue all about renewables. And I feel that we're not quite there yet. Um, so I don't support or not support. I've just and I'm trying to take in the um, amendments. Um, and but I feel a bit, just a bit, a bit concerned about how you know how this is coming coming forward. Yeah, I, may, I, may I, I just may I just comment yeah. that uh, Ed's comment about the NPPF is uh, taken account of by that wording. If Mike considers he can support it or second it we can go ahead otherwise it has to be uh, left for somebody to second it or it falls. So, Councillor Benny you, you did second it originally are you, are you withdrawing that second now or? Can I just ask um, Councillor Allen to read it out again please? Yes <laughs> if that's okay chair. <laughs> By all means. Right, 5.5. It's proposed that in order to maximise opportunities for delivering renewables and provide certainty to the industry, suitable areas for solar and wind energy are mapped. This approach was also strongly supported in the issues and options consultation, and it would equate to a significant uplift in support for renewables, which matches the council's ambition to tackle the climate emergency. <clears throat> Any such developments must show biodiversity net gain. 
5.6. In addition, a policy of general support for renewable technology, including community energy schemes in other parts of the district, will be supported, subject to an assessment of impacts. 5.7. However, industrial scale anaerobic digesters are not considered suitable developments. Thank you. I think I won't, I, I can't support it because it still talks about mapping the, the areas for solar and for wind. So I'm sure somebody else will support it, but um, I think I, I won't. But thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. So with Councillor Allen's proposal, Councillor Howe, are you now going to second it? Thank you. I will happily second that. Yes, thank Thanks you. very much. Councillor Arnold, over to you. And then I think we're pretty much going to take it to a vote. Thank you, Chair. Right, first thing to say, what a brilliant debate. I mean, we that's so much. And, and what, you know, there's Mike has just hurled in anaerobic digesters. I mean, which we could have spoken about for three hours on their own. Um, I, 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 I think what Councillor Allen has done is incredibly helpful by capturing that as well. Um, and I would be able to vote for that. But I, what I'd like to do, Chair, within the body of the report, our recommendation at the moment says this, that Strategic Planning Committee note the proposed, proposed approaches to tackling the climate emergency through the local plan as set out in the report. Um, I would like to find a way of just amending that very slightly to that strategic planning committee um, note the initial approaches to tackling the climate emergency through the local plan <clears throat> as set out in the report, comma, and welcomes further member contributions, full stop. And just the second one, that uh, SPC asks for a further report on this matter. Now, how that, how, how constitutionally, whether you're minded to work that through with Shirley or not, I don't know. But I think well, that would it's, it's still an it. amendment, Councillor. <laughs> I, I, I'm yeah. happy. I'm happy to accept Councillor Arnott's amendment if Mike Howe would Thank go along you. with it. Councillor Howe, are you happy with that? I have no problem with it, but. Ed's obviously saying he won't get a chance to bring this back apart from through the initial draft local plan. So I'm, mm. I, I suppose Ed's the driver and you are, Chair, you know, because mm. you're the ones that have got to make this work and probably fit in another meeting that Ed's got to write the report for, if you get my meaning. So it's just a cautionary tell to, to, to the leader, Councillor Arnott, you know, mm. how are we mm. going to do that, and shall we say? It, it goes back to my point earlier is that we are going fully through the plan at the next meeting it's it's this is going to be one of the sections that we do cover and we will go through so it's are we incorporating what we've said today into the draft plan and then having another report brought back at a later date or how would you wish to do it well at the moment chair um i mean and thank you very much councillor Allen and councillor how for very nearly agreeing to that i think um, I think the timing of the full report, so my second amendment there, or added recommendation, uh, was, well, I forgot what I actually said, but something like that a, that a further report is brought forward. It doesn't say when, Chair, yeah, doesn't say when. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnold. I'm Ed, happy then. Thank you. Uh, Ed, just coming to you finally, are you happy with everything that's been said? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, my, my biggest concern actually was the reference to anaerobic digesters, because I'm not sure. I think we probably need to do some more work on that because that has just come up t today, as you say, it isn't mentioned in the report. So I'm a bit concerned about the recommendation effectively ruling them out. I, I, I wonder whether or not we need to do some further work on that and come back to you. Certainly, I agree with the principle of controlling the scale of anaerobic digesters when on a commercial scale but to have a policy that rules them out completely without further evidence um, seems a bit, well, presumptuous. I, I think we need to do some further work on that and, and come back. So there's that point. Um, in terms of the further reports, yes, we could bring a further report back next year uh, after you've considered the draft working draft of the plan. Um, happy to take on board the comments in the meantime and try and 
inform the working draft of the plan as much as we can in the time that's left before that has to be completed which is imminent in terms of our report writing and then uh, we can obviously discuss that section of the the working draft of the local plan and then if there are outstanding issues bring a further report on climate change as we uh, as the plan evolves early next year I would suggest would be the best way to to deal with that um, hopefully okay. that helps okay. so, don't mind just uh, well, both mics. Just in light of that, are you happy to just add in the small little caveat of subject to evidence creation after the anaerobic digestive part? And, uh, I'm, I'm, if I could, Mike, I'm just kind of cost you as the proposer, but uh, we're not ruling out anaerobic digesters. We're saying on farm, small scale anaerobic digesters are absolutely fine and supported because they are relatively green helping farmers and everything else. The industrial ones, there is overwhelming proof they are not green. They are polluting, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it, it's that balance. I'm happy for you to go and do the work. You've got most of the work, I think, already sent to you by, from CPRE and everyone else on various applications we've had in the past. But that's all I'm trying to do is say, look, some are good. The smaller ones that work with the farms, absolutely positive you know but as soon as you start going into the industrial process size that's not helpful and they draw the materials by farm by tractor by everything else from 20 30 miles away it's not green in the slightest etc 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 but i'll go with what we have to do shall we say at this point if that makes sense then what uh, councillor ledger is proposing is subject to further evidence yes yeah exactly that Fine. I'm happy with uh, that. Thanks, Thanks very much. Okay. So I think we're finally there. So uh, I don't know if, is Mrs. Shaw still with us? Yeah, we've just, we've just got a bit of an issue. We've lost Shirley. She's sort of, she's in a twilight zone. She's sort of here, but she can't speak. Can we just have a moment so that I can just check with her that she's content what we're voting on? Because it's obviously been quite, um, convoluted and I don't want us to, to get ourselves in a muddle. Could you just, I'm sorry to do it at this time of day, could you just call a couple of minutes break and we'll yes. just be, be exactly clear on, on where we are. Sorry to do that to everybody, we'll, we'll just be back shortly. Thank you. Always nice to have a break. <laughs> Cascada, if you're there, I believe you've got your invitation now as well. I, that was um, very grateful, Mike. Thank you for sorting that out. We are, we're still on YouTube, just so that members are aware. Yeah, no, we both know. Yeah. Such a temptation to, yeah. <laughs> mute me, for heaven's sake. <laughs> you did say mute, didn't you? Not murder. Yeah. No, no, mute. It's, it's, it's just best for me all round, really. Sorry for the continued absence. The um, tech is failing us completely. I'm just double checking. I'll be as soon as I can.
Chair, if you're there, I think I think we we have resolution. Sorry for the, the delay. Oh, are we okay to, to proceed as is or? We are. What I would just like to do if we could, just because it's a bit muddled from, from the start with proposals and, and seconding. Um, can I just check with Councillor Allen and then Councillor Bailey that they're content to withdraw the initial proposals that were made and then we can go on to um, Councillor Allen's subsequent um, later proposal. Could we just confirm that that's, that's what everybody's happy with? Yep, yeah, that's what's occurred. If that's procedurally what we do, that's fine by me. That would make me happy. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So that leaves us with Councillor Allen's um, subsequent proposal, which um, hopefully was emailed over. Um, I just wanted to check, Councillor Arnott, did you propose an amendment to that that we need to incorporate? It was a med uh, no amendment to what Councillor Allen and Councillor Howe said, but an amendment to the recommendation. And so that would become that Strategic Planning Committee note the initial approaches to tackling the climate emergency through the local plan, as set out in the report, and welcome further member contributions, full stop. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the catch of the idea of climate action portfolio, you know. And then just a second recommendation um, that Strategic Planning Committee requests a further report on this subject, but no date specified. And then the only other difference was to, from Councillor Allen's um, proposal was that um, under aerobic digestive, that it would say subject to further evidence production. Yeah, okay, that's fine, that's in there. And I think Councillor Howe, are you happy to second all of that? Absolutely. I think we're there. Thank you. Thank you for your, your patience. Uh, so members, you have the recommendations and if you'll forgive me, I'm not going to read all that out again, but they've, they've just been gone through. Um, if you are happy to vote in favour of those, that's a uh, raised hand. Red Cross, um, sorry, it's not a raised hand, it's a green tick to vote for, Red Cross to vote against and a raised hand if you wish to abstain. Councillor Bailey, is that a comment you wish to make? Or is uh, it yeah, very, very quick question. Um, can the can the committee change? So, as I understand it, Councillor Allen is is changing that part of the report. But can, is that a, can we do that, or can we only change the recommendations? I think I think. Sorry, Chair. If I may. You both. <laughs> <laughs> I think Councillor um, uh, Mr. Freeman's content with that approach. Are you are you Ed? Uh, well, it's unusual, but I, I was going with it on the basis of um, we've asked met for members' views on on the report. So, in in effect, it's it's a comment on the report. Is it's it's just how you report it, isn't it? And the, the the intent is clear. Okay, thank you. Yeah, don't mess it up, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Democratic, did you have a, a score? Yep. So, Councillor Bailey, you've still got a hand raised. Is that? Bear in mind that that's now an abstention. Sorry, I'm just in a bit of a muddle. Let me take my hand down. Okay, thank you. So, Chair, I think we are there. We have 10 votes in favour. We have no votes against and we have no abstentions. So that is carried, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank everyone for the patience for that last agenda item. Really appreciate it. So that brings our meeting to an end. Um, I'd like to thank everyone, including members of the public, for their attendance. Members, can I remind you that Democratic Service Team can, will confirm when the live streaming um, and recording has stopped. You can still be seen and heard, and any comments made may be recorded. Thank you, and good evening.